Okay, uh, we now have a quorum and we'll begin the closing the justice gap working group meeting. This meeting is being recorded. With the permission of the chair, I will start with the roll call. Yes, please. Okay, Justice Tucker. I'm here. Mary Baldwin. Uh, here. Becky Sandifer. Here. Marta Alkenbrock. Here. Andrew Arruda. Here. Judge Wendy Chang. David Engstrom. Bridget Grammy. Here. Tom Green. Here. Dan Grunfeld. Eric Helland. Here. Kathy Huang. Micah Star Liberty. Here. John Lund. Here. Ruby Marquez. Kevin Moore. Here. Kristen Passmore. Here. Toby Rothschild. Here. Jim Sandman. Here. And Patricia Scatiera. Okay, thank you. Thank you. We will move now to public comments. There were two letters, one from the Stanford Center on the Legal Profession, one from the Utah Office of Legal Services. Innovation received as public comment yesterday. Uh, if there are members of the public who would like to give public comment, you can have two minutes now, but you need to raise your hand and identify yourself to staff. Staff, have there been any public comment? Yes, we have a few. Um, we'll start with uh, Stephanie Bond. You will have two minutes. Stephanie, okay. are you with them? Thank you. Uh, my name is Stephanie Bond. I'm a retired judicial assistant from Ontario, Canada. I'd like to name the key issue this group has to solve. Why can't millions of customers find anyone to serve them? Why is there an access to justice gap that needs closing? Much discussion in this group is focused on adding rules to protect the public, but protecting the public is what smothered the industry in the first place. The litigants aren't being served because nobody wants to innovate in this sector as they've done elsewhere. Litigants are worse off, so you don't need more of those rules. If you don't eliminate the barriers, innovative entrepreneurs will continue to stay away. They won't show up just because you open a sandbox unless it's a wide open one. I urge this working group to take the bold step of designing a wide open sandbox. You can't know now what specific concepts innovators, entrepreneurs and businessmen and women will have to offer. To make the sandbox a success, you first must meet the needs of the service providers. People with a passion for technology, law, justice, they want to succeed. The process of innovation takes time. Be prepared to give them time, five years, seven, enough time to road test the ideas and recoup research and development costs. There's no shortage of people who want to serve this huge market. There's a shortage of freedom freedom to run their businesses as efficiently as possible and make money while doing so. Clear out the red tape and let the market function. Get rid of the rules and regulations that are strangling the sector, or waive or repeal them. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Ms. Bond. Okay, next we have uh, Tom Gordon. Tom, you'll have two minutes. Thank you. Uh, my name is Tom Gordon. I'm the executive director of Responsive Law. We're a national nonprofit organization working on behalf of consumers of legal services. Uh, I do want to point out we did submit written testimony yesterday, and if uh, someone could check with me offline to uh, make sure that was received, I would appreciate it. Uh, one of the things that the uh, working group is going to be considering is the scope of uh, the sandbox, in particular, whether there would be a mandate to serve the underserved. Uh, I'd like to stipulate, I think we can all stipulate that legal aid is horribly underfunded and that legal services is one of the many areas where our society has failed its duty to take care of those with the fewest resources. But the justice gap extends far above those who make a, below 125% of the poverty level. In California, a teacher has to work about 10 hours just to afford one hour of work from the average consumer lawyer. A firefighter has to work 12 hours to afford one hour of that lawyer's work. 
And a factory worker on average would have to work over three days just to pay for one hour of a consumer lawyer's time. Of course, very few legal matters can be resolved by a lawyer in just one hour. So for these and other hardworking Californians, getting the legal help they need would cost them weeks of salary. As a result, it's only the ultra rich who actually have affordable access to legal help. Instead of asking whether this reform is going to benefit those who are struggling to make ends meet or those who aren't able to make ends meet, we should be asking why nobody except the very richest currently has affordable access to legal help. <clears throat> Let's not turn this into a battle between those facing poverty and those who are just getting by for whatever scraps the rich are willing to throw their way. Everyone should have access to affordable legal help and the government's inadequate funding of legal assistance programs shouldn't be used as an excuse for further inaction and allowing teachers, firefighters, and others to get affordable legal help. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gordon. Okay, uh, next we have Scott Bernstein. Scott, you'll have two minutes. Let me unmute. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes, we yes. can. Good, thank you very much. My name is Scott Bernstein. I'm an attorney in the Sacramento area. My, my comments are as follows. Payday lenders, car title loans, tax lien scams, foreclosure prevention scams, warranty scams. Subscription-based scams in general are a great way to bleed money from the people who can least afford to be bled. If non-lawyer, for-profit corporate entities are allowed to sell legal services, the obvious play will be subscription-based services that victimize those who can least afford it. The fee will be added to their high interest credit card debt a month at a time. It'll be subscription law, one size fits all. And then when those consumers have a problem that they think their plan will help them with, they'll find out the awful truth that either the problem that they have is excluded by their plan or the service that is provided is worthless. The problem will not be stopped by simply shutting down the corporate bad actor. The corporation will just file a bankruptcy petition and some other corporation will be formed to buy the book of business out of the bankruptcy and keep the scam going. The value will be too high to let it go. The real value in the business will be the predictable income stream it will generate, not in the providing of good legal services or maximizing the client's recovery. And that will not close the justice gap for low to middle income Californians. It will just saddle them with another monthly expense that they will either forget about or be too busy to reverse. If corporate ownership is going to be allowed at all, it ought to be limited to legitimate nonprofits and their size should be limited in a way that limits the scope of harm that any one bad actor can do. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bernstein. Next, we have uh, Leonard Sansowitz. You'll have two minutes. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. we can. Okay, thank you. Um, good morning. Thank you for taking this public comment. I want to address um, a few of the points that some of the Speakers who came before me made Ms. Bond uh, basically advocated for zero oversight. I think that that would be uh, foolhardy and also um, horribly, uh, uh, it, it would leave consumers uh, horribly unprotected. Uh, Mr. Gordon made the point that uh, the only ones who can benefit from the legal system are the ultra rich. I'm an attorney based out of Los Angeles. I uh, practice in an area of employment law. I know that in employment law and in consumer protections, such as uh, uh, personal injury and um, uh, products liability, attorneys work on contingency fee model basis. Uh, so uh, it's precisely because when people come to us, they have multiple issues, but they have been harmed in some way and it is unfair to ask them to pay. So someone who's lost his or her job, um, you know, it, it, would, it would be unconscionable to ask for hundreds and thousands of dollars up front uh, to be able to serve them. We incur the risk so that they can be served. Um, and some of the uh, technology that is being proposed, the uh, artificial intelligence, uh, technology is a good thing and, and it can help to drive down costs Think certain things can be automated, such as uh, client intake process and uh, reaching out to clients to remind them of, uh, of, of appointments and things like that. Um, but 
the way that it's been phrased in some of the literature here that this committee is considering is just that there is a, a single issue and, and clients rarely present with a single issue to solve. Uh, if somebody loses their job, they also are in danger of losing their apartment or their uh, mode of transportation. They may have uh, bankruptcy issues. They may have immigration issues. Uh, and so these are complex and, yeah, and nuanced. Seconds. And, thank you. So. Uh, any program and any paraprofessional program I would urge this committee to consider should have attorney oversight. And I echo what Mr. Bernstein said about nonprofits. I know that this committee will be exploring Rule of Professional Conduct 5.4, uh, and I, I don't think that it should be expanded so generously, uh, and there's already an exemption for nonprofits. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay, uh, next we have um, Laura Horton. Laura, you have two minutes. Good morning. I'm Laura Horton, principal of Horton Law Firm, an employee rights firm in Los Angeles County. I am also chair elect to the California Employment Lawyers Association, known as CELA. CELA is the largest organization of California lawyers representing working people. We must protect the most vulnerable consumers of legal services. These are the low income, low income consumers who are not educated consumers of legal services. There must be adequate protective measures. If for-profit paraprofessionals with no attorney oversight is allowed, there will be no protections for these vulnerable people. This is not access to justice. This is injustice at the expense of low and middle income consumers. This committee should be looking for sound methods to deliver legal services to these consumers, not creating a for-profit system, where the bottom line will be maximizing profit for investors rather than ensuring competent delivery of legal services. If the consumer's need does not fall into this for-profit model, will their legal needs be met? It's not likely. There are many ways to safeguard these consumers and provide legal services at a lower cost. For example, funding should be increased for existing nonprofit organizations. Pro bono legal service programs can be created and expanded to encourage lawyers to provide pro bono or low cost services. The cost of a legal education should be reduced by providing student loan forgiveness to lawyers who work for nonprofit organizations, provide pro bono legal services, or agree to provide legal services at a reduced cost. California does not need a second tier substandard delivery system seconds. of legal services for our most vulnerable citizens. This committee must guarantee these citizens are protected through sensible programs rather than encouraging profit over people. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Horton. Okay, um, next we have Jason Solomon. Jason, you'll have two minutes. And may I just ask if there are others after Mr. Solomon, how many? Uh, we have two, three more, let's see, um, after Mr. Solomon, three more. Okay, thank you. Jason Solomon, Executive Director, uh, Center on the Legal Profession. I submitted a letter and just wanted to make a few separate points um, on the scope subcommittee work, uh, particularly on letter A on your agenda, uh, the application process, who will be let in and on what basis. I think one thing you might uh, think about there is just what the overall standard is for what a new licensee needs to meet. Um, I would suggest, and I think this is reflected in some of the subcommittee discussion earlier, that the standard might be, can this entity provide competent legal services without undue risk of harm to consumers? I would note that this is actually a higher standard than the one for new lawyers, which is minimum competence. Does the lawyer, can, does the lawyer show minimum competence to practice law? Forget minimum, I'm saying for new entities, they should just be able to provide competent legal services without undue risk of harm to consumers. And then the questions you ask and the factors you look at in the application would be designed to assess their ability to meet that standard. One thing the memo seems to suggest is the possibility of using the character and fitness inquiry that we use for lawyers. I would discourage you from doing that and discourage you from spending much time exploring that. 
You could do a very limited look at felony convictions, for example, or fraud. Certainly, we don't want people uh, running involved with entities uh, who have committed those kind of crimes or, or mis uh, misdeeds. But the question here ought to be what factors predict harm to consumers and how can we assess that whether before licensure or after? And the research shows that the character and fitness inquiry does a poor job of predicting ethical violations or other practices that cause consumer harm. I'm happy to talk to more to the subcommittee or working group about better ways to try to determine that. Finally, I know I have 15 seconds on the sandbox mission statement which I don't see in there, this letter E on the agenda. My understanding of the current version is that it talks about the potential benefits as having to substantially outweigh any identifiable, any identifiable harm. I would encourage you to get rid of substantially. There shouldn't be a thumb on the scale for the status quo and also make clear that the benefits and risks of harm should both be compared to the status quo. Thanks so much for your time. Thank you, Mr. Solomon. Okay, um, next we have Angela Grihavala. You'll have two minutes, Angela. Thank you so much, uh, committee, and this opportunity to speak. It's Angela Grihalva. So uh, my name is Angela Grihalva. I am a legal document assistant, an LDA, a non-attorney legal service provider. We're here, we already exist. I competently, efficiently, and successfully service this community, community including the most vulnerable. I would like to, um, while I know we're addressing the sandbox and other issues, I just wanna be a voice to redress uh, against those who are saying uh, non-attorney services are a risk to the public. I just wanna say that's just not true. You know, the California Justice Gap Survey reveals that the significant portion of the justice gap in California is caused by a lack of knowledge about civil, the civil legal system. This is a systemic issue. People do not know how to seek redress for their grievances. Most do not recognize the legal aspects of these problems as another speaker has identified. If, this, if they do not recognize those aspects, many do not know how to access the appropriate resources to address them. The current system where legal knowledge is a privilege and we all have to recognize that, is not serving or protecting the consumer or our country. We need to empower the consumer to act through knowledge and by breaking up the legal monopoly, which is UPL, we can do that. Thank you for this opportunity to speak. Thank you, Ms. Grijalva. Okay, um, next we have Melissa Johnson. You'll have two minutes. Thank you. I would like to start with saying, well, thank you for the opportunity to speak. I too am a plaintiff's employment lawyer. I represent workers and I, I am a principal at Johnson Heater in San Diego. I'm on the executive board of the California Employment Lawyers Association and I'm a vice president of the San Diego County Bar Association. Uh, I'd like to, to, to speak a little bit uh, more about the regulation regarding uh, the, the paraprofessionals and, and ownership, that non-lawyer ownership of law firms. And, and if the sandbox would permit um, non-lawyer ownership of, of legal entities, there absolutely, absolutely has to be disclosure to the public that the people providing services or the entity that owns uh, the, the services that are provided are not owned by an attorney. They're not, the services aren't provided by an attorney. It's just absolutely essential that the buyer is informed so the buyer can be aware uh, that they aren't providing, are receiving services that are provided by an attorney, um, nor are they, those services overseen uh, by, by a licensed attorney. It's absolutely critical. Uh, another thing I think is very important is that any agreement between a legal services provider and a client must not include an arbitration provision. Arbitration is a way for um, a culpable or purported culpable uh, entity or individual to hide behind an arbitration clause in order for the grievances not to be made public. You file an arbitration, it's not Public. It's not in the public court. You can't look it up. You can't determine. Yeah, 15 seconds. Oh, thank you. 
how many claims are being made against any particular entity uh, when there's an arbitration clause. And there has to be um, appropriate oversight by an appropriate committee. There has to be training. And there absolutely must be disclosure if an, if an entity is providing legal services and not owned by an attorney. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Johnson. Okay, and now we have uh, Jeannie Harrison. This is our last speaker. Uh, Jeannie, you have two minutes. Thank you, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, great. This is Jeannie Harrison. I am the president of Consumer Attorneys Association of Los Angeles, and I have been on many of the paraprofessional working group meetings. Um, and I want to draw your attention to, I think, a number of very important issues. Just because the non-lawyer ownership of the law practice may work in other states does not mean that it's right for California. Indeed, California prides itself on having the highest standards of protection, not the lowest standards of protection for the consumers. The question is not how do we promote innovation and ensure profits for corporations or maximize profits or create new legal businesses. This is the State Bar of California and the question is how do we protect consumers? not ensure profits for corporations. So 40% of superior court dockets are contingency matters, where as you've heard, employment cases, personal injury cases, et cetera, consumers do not pay anything out of pocket for those, those cases. So the key, the key question that no one on any of the meetings that I have heard and participated in is asking, on the, in, in these matters is how are two fiduciary duties ever to be squared? First, the corporation's duty to maximize shareholder profits versus the lawyer's fiduciary duty to put the client's interest first, not That's to maximize second. profits. The justice gap is limited and specific. Indeed, there were only 12 people who said in employment cases, they did not get representation, 12 people. And that's used to say there's a crisis in employment. The state bar's failure to protect consumers could be substantially deepened if this is allowed to proceed, either the non-lawyer ownership of the practice of law or uh, paraprofessional work outside of being um, supervised by lawyers. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Harrison. I believe this concludes the public comment portion of our agenda. So we'll move briefly to announcements. Uh, I have a collection of announcements for our committee. Uh, first is that we have a new member. Judge Asbury, who isn't able to join us today because she just joined our committee officially, I think it was yesterday, maybe the day before, um, is joining our committee. And we may have additional new members uh, be appointed between now and our next working group meeting. Um, second, we have a new work plan. It is available. Um, does everybody know how if you uh, go to the meeting materials and click on announcements, you get uh, documents that are keyed to the announcement portion of our agenda? If you do that, you'll see a copy of the new work plan. The uh, goal of the new work plan uh, is to focus us on the final report for the sandbox portion of our work. You'll remember that our charter requires us to make recommendations, pro, con, and in detail about whether to uh, whether California should have a regulatory sandbox. That's what we've mostly been working on so far. And then also to address four specific areas, potentially independent of our sandbox regulation uh, that involve uh, changes to the attorney practice rules. We're, we'll talk more about that. <coughs> But the uh, work plan attempts to uh, chart out what our report will look like with regard to the sandbox so that as we work over the uh, next few months towards um, fleshing out our, our, our views and our vision on that, 
We can do it in a context that is key to what is the final product going to look like. Um, moving on now, oh, and I should say about that, that you'll see that the latter portions starting uh, in spring of next year call for putting recommendations out to public comment. So the idea would be to have our sandbox recommendations in draft form by say the end of February so that in March we can go to the uh, state bar board and ask them to authorize sending out to public comments these recommendations so that the public can have a couple of months to comment more fully on our more fully articulated vision before we have to finalize anything in the report. And then lagging by a couple of months that schedule would be going out for public comment our recommendations on the rules revisions so that again we'll get public comment before we finalize that uh, by, ne by next fall. We will be uh, tweaking the latter portions of the work plan as we work out more specifically uh, what the dates look like for our, our meetings next year um, and how that, and, and so stay tuned for that. But uh, that's the work plan I wanted to briefly introduce you to and you will recognize portions of it, those of you working on subcommittees um, from the, the pieces of work you've been doing. Uh, next is the subject of these, uh, four recommendations on rules. Uh, you all received a few days ago the uh, assignment memos. Thank you to Mary Baldwin and Andrew Tuff for the hard work they did putting those memos together. Uh, the goal is to have a couple of members of our committee uh, working with the assistance of staff also to put together presentations for our September meeting to introduce us to those topics. So this is separate and apart from the sandbox. Um, and we would like to have volunteers. Several of you have already volunteered, but I'm hoping that more of you will, either uh, during our meeting today, you can send uh, an email to State Bar staff and or to me saying, yes, I'd like to serve. And if you prefer, yes, I'd like to serve. And if I can work on this particular issue or particularly on whichever issues interest you, you can be as, as general or as specific as you want, but please do let us know. Um, and I would ask that you make those that you volunteer today or over the weekend, no later than Monday, you let us know what you're willing to take on because we want to make those assignments next week so that uh, folks can get started immediately and have uh, all of July and August and into September up to our meeting to be putting together those presentations. Uh, we'll help you, staff will help you. Uh, we've got resources in those assignment memos, so you don't need to be an expert in the area already. You just need to be willing to do the, the research, the work and the presentation. So uh, consider this a plug for you to volunteer. Mr. Stuker, let me jump in and just say, some of the members have already generously volunteered and offered their availability up for more than one of the four groups. And if you want to do that, we invite you to just give us sort of your first, second and third choice because that'll help the uh, assignment decisions when they're finally made. So we welcome even volunteers for more than one. That's true, thank you. Uh, I want everybody to know that we have, um, we have continued to monitor uh, research and articles in the, in the public press about the subject we are working on and uh, people who have uh, important things they want to include in our library are urged to continue to forward those to staff. I think in the next week or so, staff will be circulating a list of the things that have so far been brought to uh, our attention as uh, review worthy and posted to our website. So uh, last call to contribute to that before it goes out. It doesn't include and it shouldn't include every news article that mentions us, um, but it, we, we uh, do want to be uh, giving people the best data, the best information um, when people um, have, have written up something that's, that merits attention of our readers. Uh, and at least one of our group has been speaking about the work of the uh, CTJG. So Bridget, I understand uh, Ms. Grammy, you spoke to an ABA bar group uh, and would love to have you tell us who you spoke to and what kind of reaction you got. Sure, so I actually was a less than 24 hour in advance notice fill-in, <laughs> to be honest. Um, so I was able to present, but I had to go because I had another previous commitment. So I didn't hear the reaction. Um, 
And, and that's good. I'm glad you're reminding me because I do want to go back and find out if there were questions. I did offer for people to email me later and I didn't receive any emails about it. But um, basically it was the ABA um, uh, Conference on Professional Responsibility, their 40, 46th annual conference. And um, it was a just an update. It was called Regulatory Reform Part Due. And it was reports from Utah, Arizona, and California about reg, reg reform efforts. So um, I, again, because I had my previous commitment went first, so I also didn't hear <laughs> um, what the other presentations were from Utah. There was Eric Christensen um, from Utah and Linda Sheely from Arizona. And then um, basically what we were all asked to cover was just like a status of what's happening, um, factors that helped each state accomplish it so far, if there were unique situations, um, you know, what if we're getting stakeholder buy-in, how are we getting input from people, what has worked well, what were the un unanticipated consequences. Um, and so I just gave a, a brief update. It was actually more about, you know, I, I kind of gave the history from my experience on adults, what happened then, what some of the lessons we learned through that about getting input, and then, you know, where we stood with our working group, what we're working on right now, and just a little update from what I know about what's happening with the paraprofessional working group when they're expecting their report to come out. Um, etc. So I'm sorry I don't have much more. It was just much more of a report than anything, but um, people are definitely interested in following what we're doing. Okay, thank you. So just a quick note about today's agenda. Uh, we have a full one. Those of you wondering when lunch is and what exactly is happening when, um, we expect Professor Hadfield to present at 11. So our first discussion will begin and may or may not conclude, probably won't conclude before Ms. Hadfield's presentation. Um, we will plan to take our lunch break at noon and uh, I'm going to try to keep us on a, on a short schedule. Uh, come back at 1230, although you don't need to include your video if you don't want because we will have a presentation, that is say your own video, you can stay black. Um, because we're going to have uh, an after lunch presentation from uh, state bar staff involved in enforcement. And so that'll start at 1230. So lunch is from 12 to 1230, uh, but you can continue eating behind your video screens thereafter. Uh, and then we'll have uh, any further discussion of item A on the agenda before we get into the SAGE uh, led discussions. and. Uh, finally, later in the afternoon, we will, as part of the SAGE discussion, we will hear from the State Bar's Office of General Counsel regarding some research they've been doing. With that, uh, that concludes my announcements for the day. Randy, what would you like to add as the staff report? Uh, only thing I'll mention in addition to the staff report is that uh, I also had the opportunity to um, discuss the work of, of this group at a monthly Bar Leaders Conference on May 27th. And uh, there's a companion program to the Center on Professional Responsibility uh, group that uh, Bridget speak, spoke to, and that is the National Forum on Client Protection, which is really on client security funds. And I was uh, privileged to be a panelist there on the topic of alternative legal services providers and restitution funds and other client protection mechanisms. And so I was able to uh, report, uh, much like Bridget, is more of a reporting type presentation on where California is on both its paraprofessional program and this uh, CTJG working group in terms of different ways to provide legal services and what types of uh, protections, compliance methodologies, and, and remedies might be uh, explored. And that's all from the staff report. Thank you very much. The next item on our agenda is the approval of uh, the open session action summary from the April 9th, 2021 meeting that's been included with your meeting materials. Is there anyone who would wish to offer a correction to what's been circulated in draft form? And if there are none, is there a motion that we accept these? Move to approve. Thank okay. you. Hi, Toby. Yeah. Can we get a second, please? A uh, second. Was that uh, from Eric? Yes, good. OK. Uh, and I think we need a roll call on that then. Yes. OK. Um, Marta Alkenbrock? Approved. 
Andrew Arita. Uh, Mary Baldwin. Ruth. Judge Wendy Chang. David Engstrom. Bridget Grammy. Abstain. Tom Green. Approve. Dan Grunfeld. Eric Helland. Approve. Kathy Huang. Micah Star Liberty. Approve. John Lund. Approve. Ruby Marquez. Kevin Moore. Approve. Kristen Passmore. I'll abstain as I wasn't present. Toby Rothschild. Approve. Rebecca Sandifer. Approve. Jim Sandman. Approve. Patricia Scatiera. Thank you. And the record should reflect that Kathy Huang has voted through the chat to approve. Okay, thank you. Excellent. That brings us now to our new business, starting with item A, if we could have a report and that will lead to discussion from the scope group with apologies that we will be uh, cut off and need to resume after our presentation. So Becky, should I start or? So um, very briefly, I think it's fair to say that our activity is a work in progress. Um, at our last meeting, we we used the structure of the Utah application as essentially our agenda. And um, Becky and I can take this in pieces, but I think at a high level, um, though we generally liked the proposal uh, in that's embedded in the Utah application, we also thought that there was a need for significant more detail. And Kevin and Marta were particularly articulate on that, uh, as was Micah. Um, and they focused on primarily the differences between Utah and Arizona. At our next meeting, we will be taking a look at the specificity of the Arizona structure versus what appears to be the more general um, set of requests for information in Utah. So specifically looking at at least the first portions of the Utah application, there is a who section, basically who are the principals in this, in this uh, organization that is applying to be a candidate. Um, our group broadly thought that that should provide more detail, who they are, what their backgrounds are, um, what their financial interests and scope of control might be with respect to the entity. The second portion of the uh, Utah application is essentially a request for a description of what the firm proposes to do. Um, our feeling was, again, at a high level that that proposal should include how they're gonna do it from an administrative perspective. What role would lawyers have? What is the span of control that may be related to their activities versus algorithms or paralegals or whatever. So I think very much a, a, uh, an activity in process. There are other sections which Becky can certainly speak to, but you might want to stop here, Justice Tucker, and just sort of get input from, I think, probably Kevin, Marta, and then Micah in that order, but back to you. Why don't we do exactly that? I'll ask those three if they wish to add to what Tom has just said to do so. And I will also just take a moment to uh, commend the scope for the work they've done and for the uh, little report they gave us in the meeting materials summarizing where things stand. So um, Tom gave us an order. I think it started with Kevin. Okay. Uh, the only thing that uh, I would add is that uh, we need to take uh, into consideration some of the comments we received in our public comment uh, yesterday, the materials that we got as we go forward. But uh, right now, I think that uh, I thought Tom did an excellent summary that we do feel that there could be more detail in the application process. And uh, we need to look further at the Arizona report to get a little bit more insight into the rationale underlying the detailed application process that they have 
for their alternative business structures. Understanding, of course, that they are dealing with a, uh, I guess, a landscape where they have eliminated rule 5.4. They're not working within a sandbox. So perhaps the uh, immediacy of their concern of the possible risk is greater than it might be in the sandbox. But uh, that we will find out as we look more carefully at the issue. That sounds good. Marta, do you want to add something? Just briefly, uh, I think Tom did a very good job uh, kind of articulating um, the differences that were noted during our meeting between the Arizona and Utah application process. But I think it's worthy of this committee's um, further evaluation uh, how Arizona came to its application. Um, we've spent a great deal of time and heard a lot from the Utah folks but I think it's worthy of uh, some exploration of what Arizona did and why they did it so we can have a full throated and uh, complete understanding of what other states are doing um, in this very area. So, uh, and I think that's what our committee has committed to do at our next meeting. And we'd like to report back and potentially we can even discuss having um, a, full, uh, a fuller discussion as an, as an entire committee um, on those, uh, on Arizona's model. Thank you, Micah. I concur with everything that Kevin and Marta said. The only thing I'll add is that um, after the last meeting, as I was contemplating what we were talking about and kind of some sticking points, um, I, I really thought perhaps starting with the application um, uh, created more tension or conflict than just having an overall discussion and getting on the same page uh, with each other about what it is we're, we're trying to do. Um, I think one of the things that the Arizona application does well is dive into um, what are the qualifications of the folks applying. Um, there are a lot more questions about um, what I keep calling like the moral character process that our lawyers go through and the Arizona um, application and process looks into those things more fully um, than, than Utah does. Um, so we might even want to have a high level 30,000 foot view about what is this? Who do we want to apply? And then figure out what the application actually looks like. That's so that's a helpful, but and an interesting comment. And let me um, let me ask you. We did have a obviously a discussion that aired. I think two rather different views on our committee. I'm sure there's a range. I don't want to oversimplify it, but broadly speaking, there were two ideas. Uh, one would be a, a narrower sandbox. One would be a a completely open sandbox in terms of who we want to be open to, to receiving applications from. Um, and one of the reasons that I think some of us thought it was useful to move to the next step was because sometimes being more concrete um, in what we, um, in, in what it looks like helps to move us on. So I'm, if you wanna say anything more about uh, why you think it's problematic to, or what, what, what you think some of the issues are about the application process that uh, can't be resolved until we have a clearer view about how ultimately broad or, or not broad the sandbox will be. It, it seems to me there's a fundamental difference of opinion in terms of whether we as the state bar um, or this subcommittee of the state bar care about um, whether or not there are disbarred lawyers uh, you know, participating or people with criminal backgrounds or, you know, there's a lot of stuff that the moral character process in California looks into to determine whether or not people are of the right type of moral character to become attorneys. And it's a lengthy process, but it's what lawyers have to go through. And I personally think it's a good process. Um, and I think that there's an opposing view that says free market, Let's let people apply um, and we'll see what they come up with. Um, but I think that 
as we go through this process, those two perspectives are going to constantly be in conflict because they're just fundamental beliefs about how uh, the state bar and this subcommittee should be operating. I could be wrong. I, I think that's a helpful uh, elaboration. Thank you for sharing it. I do know that there are other places in our meeting materials where the exact question about disbarred lawyers and mm -hmm. uh, some of these other disqualifications will be addressed. So one of the advantages of the subcommittee uh, structure is we get to really dive down. And one of the advantages of now coming together is that we get to cross pollinate. So let's hope today's meeting will help both of the subcommittees advance their work in that regard. Um, other comments? Uh, I see Mr. Arruda has his hand raised. Yeah, I just wanted to quickly say I think it's really advantageous that we're going to have someone with a background uh, in economics uh, today. So we could save some of these questions for someone who knows about free markets and some of the kind of how that works, because I personally don't come from that. I didn't write books on that. So just, just as a, a, an idea, we could keep some of the questions we have for someone who's a world uh, kind of leader in that area. Jillian which is coming up soon. Good. Um, okay, Tom, you suggested that collection of comments before continuing on with your collective report. I don't know whether to hand the baton to you or to uh, Professor Sandifer. Yeah, switch over to Becky, because we've got, um, uh, there were sections of course in this application process, which allowed us to structure our report. So Becky, do you want to talk about risks and related? So starting with the, the Utah application as a model, the, the general sense of the group, this is the 15,000 feet sense about the risks and the benefits was that just as this group wanted more information than Utah solicits about the description of the, mo of, the, of the service model and the ownership model and the management model, they wanted more clarity about the risks and the benefits and, and a more clear request of the, of the applicant that they relate what they're doing to the objectives of the regulatory system in a very direct way. Um, but there were a number of issues that were raised. And as Tom said, this group is still in a very deliberative space, uh, but a number of issues that were raised that I think it might be useful to get the input of the broader group on so that my dream is that the next time we come together, we could actually offer a draft application. So. I think thinking about um, some concrete things that might be in the in the application or not. Um, I'm just going to go through them seriatim in this memo, and then if folks have comments, it would be be great to have them. So one thing that that um, was requested was that the entity disclose whether it has some kind of insurance to protect um, clients against loss. Not that they would be required necessarily to have it, but it must dis disclose whether or not it does. Becky, why don't I say, I don't know how many questions you have, but I'm gonna suggest that you might reel off several of them and then rather than, dis if, rather than discuss yeah. them one time. Perfect. That gives people a chance to think about what they wanna share. Great idea. A second was that the entity is required to describe its complaint process in the application. How will it handle them? How will it receive them? One of the big questions in Utah, originally Utah's application required that the, <coughs> the thing be shovel ready, right? So if you were approved, you could start working the next day. Um, and the discovery there, and John may wish to elaborate, was that that hardly ever happens, not least because in order to get the financing to do the new thing, you have to have, be approved to do the new thing to convince the investors to invest. So um, one of the proposals from the group was to ask applicants, instead of proving that they're shovel ready, to tell us how long it would take to implement the thing and, and to launch it. Um, another issue that came up that's related to the, to the innovative service was that you the application process should not require proof of concept because if something's truly new, there is no proof of concept. Uh, but instead the applicant should explain why this could work, why it would meet its goals, why it would be safe, um, and so on. I'm gonna keep talking until someone pops up. Then we move to the, um, there's a lot of, of curiosity and I think dis not necessarily disagreement, but like not settledness in the group about the point that Micah raised about what kind of upfront information about applicants will we ask and use as a screen? So 
moral character, criminal background, disclosures about past criminal history. Um, I think that's a really important question that this, this group needs to figure out. There's a flip side of that, that that is related to the moral character questions, but also to all the information that's solicited in the application, which is how much is the application gonna rely upon the applicant to tell you stuff? And how much is gonna be independently verified in some way by the regulator or through some other source? Okay, um, could I just weigh in for a second? Please. I know you're looking for something. I, I guess part of the question I would have about some of that is, to what end are we asking that information? In other words, is that driving a decision of some kind? And if it is, I think we can all agree, for example, that a disbarred lawyer should not be allowed to somehow or another slide in and become a provider of legal services through this mechanism. And I think we could all agree that a felon, you know, just doesn't seem like maybe, I mean, restorative justice suggests that maybe that's not even a fair, you know, a fair question in some respects, but I guess I, I guess I think it'd be useful for the committee, the, the scope committee to be thinking about what would you do with that information if you had it? Would you actually make a regulatory decision, yay or nay, on the basis of that? And the reason I raise that is because I think you, you kind of slide pretty quickly down to a presumptive method of regulating where you're saying, well, because you don't have this type of character, you don't have that kind of, of, of bank account to fund what you're doing, we're going to presume you're unsafe for, for consumers. So I just think it's useful to figure out why you're actually asking what you would be asking for that type of information. Let me um, jump in and ask, I know because there was a memo from I think Kevin and a co-author on Marta. From Marta, thank you, um, on, on exactly this subject. Is some, are we gonna get to, to this subject separately or is now the time to address what uh, limitations we want to put on exactly this kind of moral character and criminal background application. Well, during our meeting, I mean, this was touched upon exactly what John uh, mentioned. And in the interest of time, when our meeting was in this, at, at, we didn't have a lot of time to kind of articulate the answer to that very question. Um, what, you know, what, what, what do we do with the information gathered and how does that affect the applicant and whether or not it's automatically rejected or not based upon the responses received. So we haven't had a full throated conversation about that very thing yet because we just, in the interest of time, we didn't have, we, you know, we, we didn't get there, but we're working on it. So and it is very much something that we're, our committee is going to consider. Okay, so I see several raised hands. Let's hear from uh, Crispin, then Bridget, then Micah. That was my sense of the order they went up. Thank you, Chair. I, I agree with John. And my experience as both a regulator and helping businesses uh, that are trying to innovate enter into different markets, what starts often as a um, fairly low barrier to keep out the obvious things that we wouldn't want, you know, somebody with a history of fraud, somebody uh, with a history of ripping off consumers. In practice, regulators, particularly when it's lawyers overseeing the decision making, slip further and further into a more conservative view. And in practice, it becomes a slippery slope and the threshold that you start with becomes higher and higher and higher and the questions that get asked get more and more complicated. So I would just add some real caution on the level of detail, but give decision makers some flexibility to make the right decision in the circumstances. Thank you. Bridget. Uh, yes, I was just gonna offer that. I, I don't know, and I don't think this applies to the state bar, but there was a bill a few years ago called, I think it's AB 2138. It was a, a bill by um, Evan Lowe, and it applies to state licensing boards having to do specifically with this consideration of criminal conviction in, in the application process and also in the um, you know, license revocation process. And they have to come up with like regulations that explain the substantial relationship between the prior conviction and the, you know, the service that they're providing. So I would just, I don't have all that information in front of me, but it, to the extent that doesn't apply to the bar, it's at least worth taking a look at to see if those might provide some helpful guidance with this question. 
Thank you, Micah. The conversation that we had in our subcommittee was essentially, um, uh, again, like the moral character uh, analysis. So it's the, the information sought can be a factor in making a decision, um, but it's certainly not the only factor. It was never suggested that, you know, if you check this box, then you're out for sure. Or if you don't check that box, you're in for sure. It's just a way to have a fulsome picture of who the people are, what the entities do, how they're gonna be run, and what the backgrounds are. Thank you. Were there other comments on this subject before we move to the other subjects that Becky has been reeling off? Being, uh, so Kathy Huang has provided through the chat a comment that there could be a rubric score based on all these criteria. Um, so on other topics that Becky reeled off, if anyone wants to address questions like, uh, should we ask for disclosure as to whether or not the entity has insurance? We're not talking at this point about a disqualification, just about a disclosure. Uh, or should we require shovel readiness or ask information about getting to shovel ready? Or any of the other topics that, that Becky reeled off, if people want to add comments on them. All right, I see Bridget has a hand. I will say I alternate between using people's first names and formal titles. That's because I tend to want to use formal titles, but lapse into, especially when I'm looking at a picture that says Bridget under it, first names. So nothing is intended by my complete and utter inconsistency on this issue. Okay. Uh, I just wanted to say, I like the idea about the insurance disclosure. I think that's important. Um, and also I think the shovel ready, is, it makes sense that you would have to allow people time to get investors and you know we, we want to set people up for success so I think those two things make a lot of sense particularly. Thank you. Tom Green. Yeah this is more of an advocate but the uh, on the point of shovel readiness um, just from a regulatory perspective if somebody has a track record particularly in the technology space you know, if in Utah or Arizona or the United Kingdom, they were able to provide a service uh, successfully without too many complaints, that is enormously useful information. If somebody comes in with a concept that they've just taken to a group of venture capitalists and said, this is a great idea, let's do it. Um, I think that puts a greater obligation, Not, I, I don't think it's a veto level obligation, but I think there is an obligation for the regulators embedded in the in the sandbox process to ask a lot more questions. What, for example, how does your algorithm work if it's technology? How much data do you have to support the fact that this should work? Do you have enough scale uh, so that this is gonna be an effective piece of, of software? I mean, there's just lots of questions, but I think that is a trigger for a lot more questioning in terms of what, what should go forward. Uh, Justice Tucker, I just wanted to jump in and uh, call attention to the hour and note that I think our first speaker uh, for the day has actually uh, joined. Um, if you wanted to change the order of business, that was I we, we said that we would uh, cut this conversation uh, off um, when our speaker was, when it was time for our speakers. So uh, hold your thoughts and we will return to it. Um, after, I think we'll say after our speakers. So that will be um, after lunch. So with that, um, I'm gonna call on Professor Sandifer to, to introduce our speaker and then uh, turn it over to, to them. Go ahead, Becky. Thank you, Justice Tuker. We're very uh, privileged today to have with us Professor Jillian Hadfield who's currently the schwartz Reisman Chair in Technology and Society and a professor of law and a professor of strategic management and the director of the Institute for Technology and Society at the University of Toronto. Um, <laughs> she is, is both an economist and a, and a lawyer with uh, both of those degrees from Stanford. She's had a, a distinguished career of writing about 
um, how dispute and legal systems can be organized, how regulation can happen um, in both economies that are like ours and economies that are emerging. Um, her work now is very much on the governments, governance of AI and technological systems. She brings a, a wealth of, of knowledge and experience um, and tremendous engagement with the impact of these issues on access to justice, not just in the United States, but I know from reading her work for many years from around the world. So thank you very much, Professor Hadfield, for being with us, and we look forward to what you have to say. Thanks, Becky. And it is so wonderful to see such a great set of faces on this uh, uh, Zoom, Zoom screen. Uh, I know many of you, and uh, those I haven't yet met, I'm looking forward to engaging with you on these topics. You all know how really critical this is. And my goal today is to be as helpful to you as I can possibly be. Uh, so let me get started on uh, presentation here. And I'll do the usual, can everybody see my screen? Yes, <laughs> okay, good, I'm gonna check on that. All right, so, so I was asked to specifically address um, uh, you know, to discuss what risk-based regulation looks like, what the, and I'm gonna talk about the case for it as well here um, relative to others. I, I see, again, I see so many experts on the, the screen here who know a lot about um, risk-based regulation generally and in, in legal services. So uh, I know that there's some of you I will be um, already uh, saying stuff you know, but anyway, let me let me just get started. So, so I thought we could start with the, you know, the question, why do we regulate the practice of law at all? Um, some of you may know we, we haven't always regulated the practice of law. It's um, something that uh, is, in some ways is quite new. A core reason we regulate the practice of law is to protect the integrity of law and courts. And that's the oldest part of regulating the practice of law. That's the piece that says, um, we courts are allowed to control who can appear before them um, uh, and, and make arguments to them, present evidence to them. Uh, and that, that was actually the historical admission to the bar was literally at, at the bar in the courtroom um, uh, in the UK, uh, in England. Um, so so th that's a critical point. And I think we're all on the same page that that's something that has to be protected. And I don't think anything we're talking about is challenging that function and reason for uh, uh, regulating the practice of law to protect the law of courts, law and courts. And I don't believe that anything that we're talking about really actually implicates who can appear um, in, in, in court and make those arguments with what support. So I think that's, that's one thing. There's clearly significant implications for the, as we know, huge millions of people who are showing up in courts without any legal representation at all. So support for those people, um, but not the formal uh, signing of papers and so on. So sometimes we think this is why we protect lawyers or why we, why we regulate uh, the practice of law to protect lawyers from competition. But I think we're also all on the same page that that's not a valid justification for regulating the practice of law. It's not a valid justification for regulating uh, any profession or occupation. Um, I uh, talk about the history of this. If you want to go into great detail, there's lots of other histories out there as well about how, we, how, how our existing system has its roots in efforts to protect lawyers from competition. Uh, again, there are obviously very important reasons to regulate, but one of the things that we're facing at this moment in time with the growing emphasis on reviewing the regulatory approach is we found our way into a highly restrictive form of regulation that is no longer serving, if it ever did, the interests of people who rely on, on legal services. So I just wanna kind of get that out there as, as our starting point. So that I, th I think we all share that view, um, that that's not what we're, what we're uh, trying to figure out here. So the core reason we, we regulate the practice of law is to protect consumers of legal services and protect them from what? Well, we wanna protect them from uh, legal error, right? So we wanna make sure that the quality of legal advice and information they are getting is, uh, is, is relatively high quality. Um, 
All right, here we go. Uh, we want to protect against the loss of legal rights and advantage for people who don't know that they have legal rights relative to getting evicted, um, having collection efforts against them, and so on. We, we want to make sure people uh, are able to take advantage of their legal, their legal rights and not put at legal disadvantage. That's, the, that's a critical piece of almost all of our policy efforts um, uh, across the board, when we when we put in place rules and we put in place legal uh, rights and regimes, the presumption is that people can act on them. The presumption is that people can take advantage of them. And if we don't do that, we don't accomplish those those uh, policy objectives. We want to protect people against incorrect and bad advice. So quite apart from this legal effort, there's judgment um, uh, about how people should respond to their legal um, problems. And of course, we also uh, structure our, our regulation of legal services to protect uh, consumers against fraud, against lawyers who, or anybody who takes their money and says, I'm going to file your documents for you, uh, but never does, uh, against theft if people have handed over retainers or funds or entrusted funds uh, uh, to legal services providers, and abuse of trust. So our conflict of interest rules address this one, that, that I, I'm trusting that you're representing my interests. So uh, I'm sure that you could come up with other things, but just to sort of get out there on the page, you know, why, why is it that we are regulating in the first place? Primarily, it's protecting consumers of legal services from these things happening. So our regulatory approaches, things that we could do to accomplish that objective. Well, one thing you can do is actually just leave it to the market. Uh, and to voluntary licensing, which is what happens when you get a profession that emerges and creates a licensing regime for its members, which then is a signal to the market that when I'm choosing somebody to, to assist me, I could choose somebody with that professional licensing, or I could choose somebody without that professional licensing. And we could leave it to the market. Um, and there are, there's a lot of, uh, uh, protection that does come from the market in terms of information and feedback uh, for what is what is provided here. Uh, uh, but we know, of course, that it's not not perfect. And in the background, we have, as we do in a lot of other uh, sectors, consumer protection law that protects people against fraud and misrepresentation uh, and so on. Then we could take this approach of which we, we've ended up in in North America in a very uh, powerful way of licensing professionals. Um, so that's creating that profession, but then making it mandatory, requiring that anybody who provides services is a member of this uh, profession, has maintained, has earned and maintained this license. We do that with educational requirements, a bar exam, and I just I joined your, your conversation. Uh, just as you were finishing up uh, before uh, a few minutes ago, some discussion around moral character requirements. Uh, so we, we, we front load that uh, effort to regulate by saying, let's make sure we get the right people and we train them well. And then we rely on professional discipline, complaints and malpractice claims uh, for, for ensuring that that regulation is, is working. And this approach here that what we're going to talk about in terms of uh, um, risk-based regulation, a key shift is the shift from focusing on licensing people to licensing services. And you can think about this as a shift from personal regulation to organizational regulation because the services can be provided by other organizations. That's actually one of the things that's relevant for the moral character conversation you were having. Um, when we're talking about licensing an organization to provide a service, what you want to make sure is that the organization is operating with integrity and it's not particular people necessarily who affect that because they may come and go if the organization is um, authorized to provide the service. You want to focus on that organization. So just sort of looking down this list and say, well, where do we see these, uh, see these forms just to, to, to emphasize the first one of leaving it to the market with voluntary licensing. Actually, there's a lot of that around the globe. Um, uh, in the in the UK, as I'm sure you've had discussions with Crispin and others on your uh, on your in your group, um, there's a large fraction of legal services that in North America require um, licensing do not require licensing. Uh, in the UK, so 
legal advice, help with documents, and so on. Uh, so that so that that actually is an area where it has been, in a sense, left to the market and voluntary licensing. I could choose to go to a solicitor to draft my will, or I could choose to go to um, a will writing company that's in the unregulated sector uh, in, in England and Wales. Uh, as I've mentioned, the licensing professional, I should say also in large parts of the world, uh, lawyers who provide services to corporations uh, who are in-house corporate uh, lawyers are not, in, in many cases, they're not allowed to be members of the bar. Uh, so that's another domain. Um, so if you're thinking about thinking about evidence of what do we know about how this works, you want to think about the fact there's well-established environments that have a much, much uh, lighter uh, regulatory environment. As I said, in, in North America, in the US and Canada in particular, talking about here, the, the approach is licensing professionals. And the risk-based licensing of services is pretty much brand new. That's what Utah has um, um, put into the sandbox. I know you're hearing lots of that with John and Becky uh, and others on, in your, in, in, on your group. Um, uh, but it's it's new, and that's an important thing to emphasize. This is about your this. If if you head in this direction, you are on the cutting edge, um, and uh, we are in the process of figuring out how best to to accomplish this. Um, so um, I'm going to give a B plus grade to that. Leave it to the market voluntary licensing approach, consumer and relying on consumer protection laws. I mentioned that. Um, uh, covers a large fraction of the legal market in the UK. And we know that there's actually, we've got lots of evidence that there's uh, pretty good quality there um, and that the quality you get from something different is not higher. I'm, I'm putting it at a B plus just to say, well, we don't have, there's no, some, some of those areas we might want to see some, some, some oversight, uh, but, uh, and I'll go into a little bit more on the evidence in a minute. But here's the thing, I would give us a D on the licensing of professionals, not because our professionals in general are not quite good um, or that for the, um, uh, the you know, the, the, that our education and bar exams, I mean, there's all kinds of issues around our education and bar exam approaches. Um, but the fact of the matter is, as we all know, um, we're looking at pictures like this. This is from the, the, the 2019, um, uh, California survey, um, and you get the we get the D on this licensing approach because so few people actually obtain any help under that licensing approach, and that means that our regulatory system is not performing its function very well because it's protecting potentially those consumers who are obtaining help, but it's doing it at the price of excluding the vast majority of people who need legal help from any. So if you want to think about that consumer protection perspective and what are we trying to do, protect consumers against legal help, uh, against legal errors, protect them against the loss of legal rights, uh, protect them against uh, bad legal advice and judgment. All those harms are happening in huge, huge numbers because of this regulatory approach. And in fact, this, the numbers that are here were in the figure are about low-income California. And of course, as you, as you know, I'm sure you focused on this fact. These are the same numbers all throughout the income distribution. Um, so that this is not a problem of poverty. This is not a problem of uh, uh, indigence. This is a problem throughout the income distribution. Um, and the numbers are basically the same for, for all Californians. Uh, now I've been giving talks and showing a list of numbers like this for at least 10 years, but now I'm just drawing on the numbers from the state bar survey. Uh, just to remind you, 55% of Californian adults say that they have a significant legal problem when they're given that list. That works out to 51 million problems. 70% of them have no legal help as we've just seen. So that's 36 million problems that are going that are going unaddressed um, with with legal help and expertise. And I've done this calculation in various ways just to remind you that if you wanted to get uh, all of those uh, people with problems just an hour of help with uh, with those problems, and if you were going to uh, if you think the price for that is something like two fifty an hour, which is 
probably a bit low actually for the average price for an, a lawyer providing services to uh, ordinary people and small businesses, that would be $9 billion. Um, uh, if you're thinking about addressing this through any kind of legal aid or public, public funding, um, or 200 hours of pro bono a year from every single licensed attorney in California. That's a point we've just been discussing in this field, as you know, for a long time, that this is why it's so critical to be thinking about how to move forward on the sandbox and to make it as effective and as broad-based as possible because the scale of the problem is massive. Now let's think about that existing regulatory approach, that one that focuses on the person and the licensing and the title. What we know happens there is that ha all of that work and everybody's got a law degree, myself included, you know, did all that work to gain that law degree, go to law school, you know, get an undergraduate degree, get into law school, get the law degree, write the bar exam, um, satisfy those moral uh, character requirements and so on. But then once we have that license in hand at the beginning, they then is actually fairly little oversight ongoing. There's, there's continuing education requirements and so on, but there's not a lot of oversight about what's actually happening in terms of those consumer risks that we identified, the reason for regulation. And we don't collect very much data about the actual quality of services. Um, Kristen and others may have already spoken to you about the you know, sort of the striking secret shopper study in the UK where it looked at compared wills written by solicitors to wills written by unregulated will writing companies, uh, where that's, that's authorized, that's not an unauthorized practice of law in England and Wales, and found that they had the same error rates, 25%. And so the fact that they're the same is very significant. And the fact that solicitors have a 25% error rate, significant, with these are significant errors. These are forgot a kid, um, didn't carry uh, didn't didn't carry through on testator intent uh, a very high rate and we just have a few little pops of information like that but enough to make you concerned we do have good studies in the UK as well showing because we have significant numbers of, ser of services available without uh, the professional title regulation um, and for a long time we've had the studies that have shown that uh, in fact a key predictor of the quality of service, is not the licensing of the provider, the title of the provider, but rather the extent to which that provider is able to specialize in the particular service they're providing. And what we know about the practice of law for those who provide services to um, ordinary people in small businesses, which are the vast majority of our lawyers who are operating in, in small law firms of generally two to five people, that they have little capacity to specialize. And so they are often required to kind of take what comes through uh, the door in terms of work. And we just know that that's, it's not a consequence of a lack of expertise uh, of uh, intelligence or capacity for those people, but it's very hard to be really good when you don't specialize. And we also know that there are obstacles to the malpractice constraints on the practice of law. Um, it's very expensive to bring a malpractice uh, action um, um, most of them, um, that we, that it, it, it's expensive. It's very, you have to prove it's, it's a high bar. It's actually different from the medical malpractice standards. You have to prove something at the higher threshold of what you have to prove. And unfortunately, and I learned this personally, California, I think probably still has a rule in place that sets a one-year statute of limitations on malpractice and a four-year statute of limitations on collecting an unpaid bill. Uh, so as I learned, Personally, when you think there's been a legal error and you have an argument with your lawyer, um, they just don't write to you to collect on the bill for 13 months. Um, and then your, your malpractice claim is gone. So we have significant obstacles to the malpractice uh, uh, source of, of limitation. Okay, so what is risk-based regulation? I'm gonna give you some, some characteristics and then go through, uh, talk through each of them. So for given, it, it's for a given service and an intended consumer brace, identify and weight the risks. So identify what could go wrong, how bad it could be, would be and how likely it is. Ask, what happens without this service? What are the risks in the absence of the service? So it's important to evaluate the status quo. Calibrate 
the response to um, the, the, those risks, imposing requirements only to the extent necessary to ensure consumers are not made worse off by the risks posed by the service. And then auditing and collecting data. So the key thing here is looking at what happens after you put this regulation in place. So let me, uh, let me, let me work through these um, in, in a bit more detail. So uh, first of all, we want to identify, again, it's a focus on the service not the not the the provider the characteristics of the provider per se it's for a given service and an intended consumer base so you regulate the service and not the title so for example uh people coming into the sandbox would be saying we want to provide the service of assistance with filing immigration forms so that's for that service think about the intended consumer base there what are the risks for that intended consumer base could say where we want to provide assistance to small businesses with uh, filing corporations. Or we could want to provide assistance to large corporations providing M&A work. The focus on the service and the intended consumer base is important now for thinking about the risk. You can just sort of, as you read that through, think how you would think about risk in these different uh, contexts. What are the risks? How well can the, uh, the intended consumer base uh, uh, protect themselves against those risks. What need is there and what kind of uh, uh, regulation would be helpful? Then we wanna think about identifying and weighting those risks of what could go wrong, how bad is it, um, and how likely is it? Um, and the key thing here is that if you are trying to, it's, it's just a you know, complete <laughs> mind shift to thinking about regulation from a risk-based pr uh, perspective, means we want to be focused on getting data. We want data and not hypotheticals about what could go wrong. Lawyers are actually quite good at the hypotheticals about what could go wrong. Oh, you know, uh, it could be a scam. They could do this. They could miss the third child when writing the will, et cetera, because it's complex. But if we're going to shift to risk-based regulation, it's really important to recognize we're looking at data and not hypotheticals about those risks. We want to use risk assessment tools. So there are, you know, it's not just sit around and, and dream up what are the risks. There are tools that we can that we can use to identify. I mean, even just starting to be systematic about uh, what are the possible outcomes, and then trying to evaluate what the the cost of those would be, what the impact would be. So using risk assessment tools, and then collecting and analyzing data, which, to be honest, is a matter of staffing. Um, and having the staff on hand to actually conduct that analysis of data. Um, then you've got to ask what happens without the service? And uh, this is a key thing as we've already noticed that without these services, without the assistance with immigration forms, for example, there are existing risks of legal error, loss of rights and legal advantage, incorrect and bad advice. These are the, there are, we need to look at the landscape of those risks in the absence of this help. And that's why it's important to keep that big pie chart and those huge numbers in mind. There's, these risks are being born right now and we have that data about who's bearing those risks and what the costs are to them. So for example, let's suppose we were looking at um, uh, a company that wants to uh, provide an, uh, an AI-based tool, machine learning-based tool to interpret documents like leases and employment contracts or subpoenas. We want to evaluate whether or not we should license the organization, the firm that wants to provide this, uh, provide this tool. It could be a nonprofit organization too. Well, we have lots of evidence that this risk is really big for almost all individuals and small businesses. Uh, these risks of not getting the service. We know that the vast majority of people with uh, lay people without uh, training are making mistakes, interpreting their leases, interpreting their contracts, and understanding what the subpoena means. Here's just a, a tiny piece of, of uh, illustration of that. Um, you all are aware, I'm sure, that covenants not to compete are not enforceable in California. So that an employee can't be told when they leave one corporation that they can't go work for a competitor. 
And yet 20% of low wage and low skill workers in California sign those uh, contracts with those terms in them. So this is like the person working at the sandwich franchise is signing that provision. And we also know from great experimental work like uh, people um, uh, have done that lay people think that if I've signed a document, that's it, there's nothing left to be said. If it says in that document and I signed it, I can't go work for the competing subway shop or sandwich shop, that's all I can do. We know those errors are being made all the time with real consequences for people. <clears throat> so this is the point about this. We know this is we know this is huge. Um, that those air that ex existing landscape of, of risk is quite great. Okay, so now let's take this point about calibrating, imposing requirements only to the extent necessary to ensure that consumers are not made worse off. So if a layperson makes a mistake interpreting their lease 25% of the time, we don't want to impose a we, the that that in, that that consumer is going, that person is going to be better off with an AI tool that has better than 25% uh, error, that makes fewer errors than they do without that tool. I think actually you wouldn't get too many AI tools with as high an error rate as that because we can actually see it and you can improve it. Um, but you can't justify that. So we need to, that's how we need to validate that. Now, I know that one of the conversations that, um, uh, people are having, we had it in Utah as well. It's, well, maybe we wanna just limit our sandbox to, um, to, to the, the you know, consumer services or, uh, and not, not the uh, big type of big loss services. But notice that if what you're trying to do is change your regulatory approach to change that mindset to being risk-based and not protection-based, it, it's almost impossible to justify greater restrictions on big loss services. Uh, than on the ones that are being provided to consumers. Um, not only the consumer, the, the customer base is clearly in a much, much better position to protect themselves, um, but you can't, you can't make the, you can't apply consistently this standard um, uh, without take, recognizing that that's where, it, that's where it takes you. And that's the commitment that has to be made in, in shifting to risk-based regulation. You have to be making that commitment. <clears throat> and finally, this is the auditing and collecting of data. What does that mean? It means things that we don't do with lawyers, but that we can do if we start focusing on services. So we can test random sample, uh, samples of, of the uses of, of the service. We can require providers to supply data about the services uh, and the experiences of their customer base with those services. And we can engage in a different form of professional regulation, which means professional regulators, policy expertise. You recognize that what you need are people who are gonna be competent at understanding and analyzing the data and evaluating those risks, not making the judgments. We're allowed to make judgments. You know, we, we need to make judgments collectively and politically and as legal professionals about uh, the nature of harm, possibilities of what could happen. But we need professional pro expertise, policy expertise, data expertise to audit and collect that data. <clears throat> I think this is also very important to understand of why you can't, I know there was some conversation about this before I, I started. Um, you can't require participants to prove everything up front. Maybe this is related to it can't require it to be shovel ready because part of what people need to do is to get authorization in order to start um, uh, developing the product and, and getting investors. You can't require participants to prove everything up front because nobody has operated like this. So we don't have that data. So you're wise about what you put into the, the sandbox, but you then audit and collect that data. So let's dig a little bit more into that. How do we deal with this problem? That we don't currently have the data we want and need to really implement this regulatory approach. So unfortunately, there is no regime that you can go out and say, okay, show us how this works, show us that you've already done it and give us all the data so that we can um, have confidence in the outcomes. There is no regime that has that evidence to share yet. Utah is in the process of developing it. Ontario is, start, is, is starting down this path. But that doesn't mean we don't have lots of information about why this is um, the better way to approach regulation. 
So uh, again, the UK, uh, we have decades and decades of evidence about what happens in that no regulation regime because there hasn't been regulatory requirements around a significant share of, of legal services. And what we know from that data is that the risks of harm there are by and large low. We also know that that regulatory approach uh, is, has been much more effective in uh, providing people with legal help. So whereas, as we just saw, less than 30%, 30% of Californians are getting legal help, double that are getting legal help in the UK. And a, a result that I've kind of been emphasizing for a long time, the rate of lumping it, which is to say doing nothing about your problem, um, studies show that whereas where that's around, I think in, in the California study, it shows it's over 40% in California. Uh, st some studies in the, in the UK show it, it's much lower, something like about 5%. Um, so that's, that's evidence about the comparisons uh, between where we are and, and where we need to go. Um, UK also has legal services board risk analyses uh, that have looked at you know, what are the actual risks over time that are, have, um, were seen as, as they moved from uh, the regime that said that lawyers couldn't work with alternative business structures to one that allowed that. Um, and very intriguingly and importantly from that, when they do careful risk analysis, they see, first of all, that the actual risks um, are different from the ones we hypothesized. Um, and, uh, and again, the, the results about uh, relatively low risk. The secret chopper study I've already mentioned, um, showing us that our, the, if, again, that relative risk, which is the point about risk regulation, the relative risk of the licensed versus the unlicensed is actually pretty close to zero there in that particular example. It's also important to recognize that risk-based regulation is common in lots of domains. Um, this isn't something that's just been dreamt up by some uh, legal regulatory reformer. Um, it's used in lots and lots of domains. Um, and in fact, it's a gold standard. Uh, those of you who are following what's happening around AI, for example, and, and uh, these technologies, uh, this is well, well established uh, throughout the EU and is the, uh, the, the framework of uh, their proposed regulations on AI. So there's lots and lots of um, uh, reason to recognize that this is just bringing legal regulation into alignment with sort of the gold standard for approaches on regulation. Now, and then the whole point of a sandbox is a sandbox, right? A sandbox, which means cordoned off, studied, tested, and managed in a way to, uh, to explore a new regulatory approach. The whole point of that sandbox is to test and collect data. Uh, and that's what you want to be doing. So we can, and we can be using established risk models for doing that. Um, and it's important to go for scale to get good data uh, and have a good, a good test. I'm going to say a little bit more about the data in a minute, the scale there. Um, and we don't want to substitute just guessing and biases for, for data. So you have to get this thing off the ground. Um, now, I was going to say more about scale. I think I've um, or maybe that's, let me just, we don't want to protect what we're doing this for protecting lawyers. So uh, the need for scale, uh, you need that sandbox to generate, succeed and generate evidence. So you want to think as you're making your design decisions about what you're going to require for getting the sandbox going is, is it going to be successful? And because you need it to be successful to get the evidence you need in order to be able to uh, deploy these uh, services much more broadly. Innovation is risky and tech innovation especially requires scale because there's a lot of upfront investment. So you need lots of users to justify that investment. And scale requires a big funnel. So you, a big funnel of a possible users of a service, uh, a new service. So you want few restrictions on what or who can participate other than those that are based on risk assessments. The problem is massive, as we know. And I ended my, I spoke to your task force in 2019, and I finished with, and there I spoke primarily on the question of why do we need to do this? Uh, and I'm really delighted to be back here now saying, okay, now how do we do this? We're past the why, and we're on to the how. 
And I ended my presentation then with, um, it, it had just, I think I, I, I spoke to the task force just days after the, com the comment period had closed. And there was a lot of distress about the fact there had been 250 or so um, very unhappy uh, lawyers who had written in to oppose the changes. And it felt, I think, for the task force that it was just, you know, it was just this tidal wave uh, that, that was coming in and about to completely swamp the effort. We can't move forward. There's so much uh, negative um, uh, comment that's coming in. But it's really important to remember this. So let me get, you got those 250 complaints. There's 250,000 lawyers in California. There's 4 million small businesses that have legal needs. And there's 36 million Californian adults who are facing legal needs. The scale is huge. And that's why it's so critical to be, uh, to be making these changes. So I'm delighted to, I'll stop here and uh, delighted to answer any questions or explore any issues with you you'd like. Thank you very much. And I know that there will be lots of questions. I'm going to call on people as I see they have raised their hands. But as they start to do that, I'm going to ask the first question, which comes from the very first thing you said. You said that we uh, regulate the practice of law to protect integrity of law and courts. And none of that is affected by anything we're talking about here which made me wonder, are you assuming that we will not be allowing, we will not be uh, licensing entities to provide a service that includes actually representing clients in court? That is my assumption. Um, and I'm, uh, we've got John here and Becky who are, who are a bit closer to the ground of what's happening now in Utah, but that's, that, that has always been my assumption that we are not changing the requirements on who can sign as a representative uh, for somebody else in court, that these are legal services that are being provided into the market to provide legal help to consumers short of represent representation. Now, I think that's somewhere you could go, somewhere you could explore, but I, I would certainly say I wouldn't start there. Um, and maybe, maybe I'm talking out of turn here, and John or Rebe uh, Becky might have something different to say. But I think that's an important uh, it's important thing to recognize that that uh, that representation and that argument um, doesn't have to be part of what's uh, 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 on the table here to get started. We do have tons of self-represented litigants, as I'm sure you know. Um, so there are services that would be in support of people who are appearing in court, but your alternative there is that person is representing themselves. And I think that's probably a worse outcome for courts. Okay, thank you. I haven't seen hands raised yet. I don't know if that's my error. Uh, I'm me... seeing Thomas from before and John with a hand up on my screen. At any why don't we have Thomas and then John and I'll figure out why I'm not seeing the hands raised. Tom, Tom do you have a question? Uh, no, actually, I just had left it on from earlier. My apologies. <laughs> I see. And was there anybody who... Why don't we do the old fashioned? Well, I don't know if it's old fashioned. I've got John and Micah there with hands up. Okay, let's have John and then Micah. Hi, Jillian. Um, I, I guess I, one of the questions I, I'm hoping you could explain for us is why, why wouldn't the regulator also try to predict and then measure potential benefits from these services as well as harms? That's, that's a question. And then kind of related to that, when you talk about this chicken and egg problem where, you know, you, all you can do is perceive risks about a proposed service. You can't really know until you actually start letting the, per, the entity do that. And then you're putting potentially consumers, you know, at risk, right? Because you've let them out on what you think the, the risk might be. You've let them go mm -hmm. out in the marketplace. So how, how do you approach that in a way that sort of still protects consumers? And, and, and I'm sorry, that's too many questions, but go for it. That's all right. Thanks, John. Um, so first of all, on the benefits point, so I think that what, what you're, you're regulating in order to correct for, for market failures, right? And, and, and you, it, it, ordinarily we say, let's, let's leave it to the market to figure out where the benefits are and, and, who, and, and that's evaluated by consumers. Is there a benefit to me of this product? If so, I'll buy it Is, or the service it's worth. So, so entrepreneurs and investors, developers have an incentive to figure out where there might be benefits. 
The concern is that the consumers may not have enough information to evaluate the benefit. They may be misled about the benefit. And this is a very important factor in law because it's, it's one where you, need a level, you may need a level of expertise in order to evaluate, is this beneficial? Was it done correctly? So in a sense, what you're saying is we can leave it to the market. We can leave it to the developers of these services. That's, that's what the market is incentivizing. That's actually why you want to get investors and developers and innovators into this space because they're the ones who could figure out, hey, I could build an AI tool that would help people reliably understand their lease or their employment contract or what a subpoena is. So they look for the benefits. So what, what you're doing with regulation is saying, we're not trying to be the central planner deciding who should get what services and what would be beneficial. We're trying to make sure that, that pro we're, we're balancing out that market process for assessing benefits by focusing on what's the risk of allowing the market to determine the benefit. So that's, that's, that's why I would say you don't, because otherwise you're just into the world of central planning and we don't know enough about the, you lose, do I know, does anybody know what the, you know, um, uh, where, there's, where there's benefit? And so that's, that's I think, uh, a reason for that. Now, about the chicken and egg problem, that's why, you know, we're, that's why you're starting this off because of the lack of current evidence. We should have a lot more evidence and there is a lot of evidence to draw on. I emphasize that from the UK and other parts of the world. Um, so, and we have tons of evidence about the existing risks and harms from our existing approach. But in terms of saying, okay, so what's the risk of having um, online legal help, you know, $50 for 30 minutes of, of advice or an AI-based tool to interpret documents? That's why we, we're, the proposal is for a sandbox. Right, so you, you do your best to model those risks, to anticipate them, and you monitor like crazy. And you don't start with things. This is maybe why my, my answer to uh, Allison's question at the beginning, I wouldn't start with the things that look like, oh, if this went wrong, this could be really, really bad. You know, death penalty appeals or, uh, you know, liberty interests at stake. Although remember, we got a lot of civil law stuff that is huge, right? It's, it, it, it's it, it can have implications for liberty. It can have implications for relationships with children and health and so on. But if you say we can't build it until we're confident it's 100% great, we just, we say, and so we're willing to turn our backs on the massive numbers of people who don't have legal help. Can you do it in a thoughtful, careful way? Yes. I would say, look at vaccine rollouts, <laughs> look at vaccine development in COVID, right? We, we, we had to speed up those processes. We had to be, you know, we had to test, we had to get it out there. And that's because relative to the risk of doing nothing, it was more important to take those risks. So I think, I think it can be calibrated and it can be careful. I'm really, there's also a lot of things. If you went down your list and said, what's the risk here? Eh, it's not so great, but it would be really valuable to people to have some help here. Thank you. Toby has a question. Um, Michael was, I think the next in line, just in, on my, just, right. I can see, I think you haven't seen it there. Yeah. I, uh, Micah, Micah and then Toby, sorry. Toby can go first. Are you, are you, you have a burning question, Toby, you got to get out. I have a couple. So maybe if Toby just has one. Oh, Wait, Toby is on mute. On so mute. Micah. Okay. Um, I just want to thank you so much, professor. Um, you've obviously been working in these, in this arena for a very long time and I am a newbie. So I, I wanted to ask a couple follow-up questions to make sure I understood what you were saying. Um, you talked about in the malpractice context that errors are happening either way. Um, is that, did I understand that correctly? Uh, it, it, in the, yes, in the, um, uh, well, I wasn't sure if that was malpractice. I, I was saying the error, error, you know, under our current regulatory regime where we license lawyers and we, that we, we focus on who's the lawyer and that's our protection system. Um, we are getting lots of errors that are happening uh, because people don't get access to that service. So I, th I think that's what, um, but, but, but why don't you just ask me what it was you were, don't, don't worry about characterizing what I said. Tell me what you're wondering about. Okay, I, I'm, I'm wondering what your thoughts are on our current discipline system here in California. Are you suggesting that next of a, a sandbox that we also take a look at how we're disciplining lawyers now and whether or not that system is effective? 
Yeah, so I, I'm not an expert on the California disciplinary system. I've certainly read lots of papers about, you know, how we do unauthorized practice of law. I, um, you know, I, I, I know the numbers are, are, are not high, and I've also seen malpractice claims. So that's the malpractice one that says, you know, the, these are, um, a lot of these are things like, um, you know, missing filing deadlines or those types of things. Um, the... Yes, if, if, if I was 100% in charge and got to design whatever system I thought was optimal, I would say we should be doing this across the board, but not it. So we always want to have a, a, comp a complaints driven process available. You need to have a complaints driven process available, I think, for individuals to come in and say, you know, this individual lawyer or provider you know, did this wrong and I'm entitled to redress or I'm entitled to um, some kind of, of, of response to that. So I, I, I wouldn't wipe that out. But the auditing approach of saying, don't, don't leave it to the consumer to identify the error and take on the, the process of having to initiate disciplinary claims or complaints and so on, right? You, you, you don't want to only rely on that. So if I was designing a system, I would say, we should be auditing lawyers' performance in the same way that we're proposing to audit with Sandbox. Now, you don't have to do that in order to launch a Sandbox. I think that's, that's really clear. You could, you could launch the Sandbox and really touch nothing about, about lawyer licensing and discipline. So there would be two different systems for non-lawyers and lawyers in terms of discipline or catching errors or remedying the problems caused by a lawyer or a entity in the sandbox, is that what you're suggesting? There, there, yes, yeah. so, so you may have different systems and this is something we've discussed a lot and John may be able to speak to it better you know, in the context of, of how things are, are progressing in, in Utah. At the end of the day, I think the appropriate approach is a risk-based regulatory approach that focuses on services. Um, and that requires auditing of results. Um, so I think, I, think, I think you could be pursuing those simultaneously. Um, I'll make a prediction about where you end up on that, which is you're gonna have, uh, and they could be lawyers who are part of these services, right? Because right now the rules don't allow lawyers to be partners or investors or have other investors in providing the services. So it's going to be lawyers on both sides here. Um, uh, but I make a prediction that because those entities, you're requiring them to provide evidence of how, uh, of the quality of their, their service, and we're auditing for that. Uh, I would think actually lawyers would start to say, yeah, I'd like you to, you know, I'd like to be able to say to my consumers, um, you know, I had 99% accuracy uh, when I was audited or studied last year. Okay, one, one last question and then I'll yield. Um, you had a slide that talked about $9 billion and lawyers billing at two fifty dollars an hour. Yes. Did yes. any of that, any of the analysis contained in that slide um, reflect contingency fee lawyers? Um, well, that what that's an estimate of is if you think you're going to address the unmet need, legal need, so people who are not going to lawyers now, who are not getting legal help now, if you were going to provide help to those people and you were going to do it through like a legal aid kind of system or a government subsidy system, that's what it would cost for an hour of help at current rate. So that's that does so so that already takes out anybody who's accessing services. Um, on conting contingency, it does help with access to justice. It's, it's an important thing, but it's a tiny share of the legal need. So, you know, contingency is going to operate for somebody who's in a plaintiff uh, situation uh, with a, a sufficiently large uh, uh, tort or other monetary claim. And that, I, in other words, that's a tiny share of legal need and demand. Um, so I think about the California survey, you know, it's, 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 um, yeah, it's health, it's employment, it's family, it's all kinds of settings where uh, uh, contingency fees are not, not likely to be helpful. And we also know that, that many people who, have, you don't have a big enough claim, you don't get, you don't get taken on by a contingency lawyer. I'll, I'll be sure to tell my, all my clients this. <laughs> all right, thank you.
Thank you, Micah. Toby, you're next. I was just going to point out uh, in response to the first discussion that uh, that you had about uh, access to about going into court, that our sort of sister panel that's looking at paraprofessionals, in fact, would allow paraprofessionals to go to court for everything except jury trials. So including court trials, including motions, including everything else except jury trials. So that is part of the discussion that's going on within the bar, although not in this panel. Yes, and, and I'm not, I haven't, uh, I haven't seen what, what, what work they're, they're thinking about, but I note that if, if they are talking about paraprofessionals, they're talking about licensing a title and educational requirements and examination and so on. So I, I presume they're doing that with a view to serving that interest of protecting the integrity of court and the law. Yes, thank you. Bridget. No, you're on mute, Bridget. Sorry, I lowered my hand instead of un unmuting. <laughs> say, it's so nice to see you back. I was on the ADELS task force and really appreciated I know your presentation. It really helped me think about all of these issues in a really different way. And so it's so great to hear, as you say, now we're talking a little bit more about the how instead of the why. Um, one of the big questions that came up a lot during ADELS from the comments and everything we've heard, and since I think we all are focused on this, is this issue of access to justice. And I know when you're talking about evidence, I've heard a lot of sites to at least one study that showed that the UK's you know, change did not really increase access to justice. Um, and I don't, I'm not trying to like say whether that was a good study or not. I'm just saying these are arguments that we've heard that they didn't really address the justice gap. And I know I've talked with Crispin about this a lot. I think part of it is their design was different and they were designed to address, you know, competition as opposed to starting off from, you know, a justice gap standpoint. And we are chartered with, I mean, part of our charter is really targeting in on this justice gap. And so my question is, when we're talking about the market and you're thinking about incentives and scaling and investing, it's, I can imagine that it would be hard to, for investors to want to invest in a company that's going to serve a population that doesn't have a lot of money to spend on these services. And so I'm wondering if you in your research have, have other ideas or I've seen other models of how we might, as part of the regulatory system, incentivize products and services that do and that would you know focus on targeting the specific justice gap that we have seen in particular areas like in our California justice gap survey I hope that makes sense I don't know if that makes sense uh yes let me just uh just there's a, there were two parts there so let, let me start at the the beginning and then I, I think I'll remember but if I don't uh, just remind me on the second sure. part so the first part was you know where's the you know what about these studies which I don't think actually exist that, that show that the UK reforms did not have an impact on access to justice. Um, it's really important, that's why I want, it's really important to recognize the, U, the UK started in a very different place. They already had much, much greater uh, access to justice. So like some of the numbers I put in there to say, um, so whereas in, in the California study, 30% of people are getting some legal help with their legal problems. That number is 60% in the UK, twice as many, right? So, and, um, and, and those who are then, are, and so, so that's a much, so, so you know, there's a, there's a huge impact. They also have much more generous legal aid. It's le a lot less generous today than it used to be. I mean, there was a point at which it was 70% of the population was eligible for legal aid and it covered everything, civil, um, uh, civil claims and, and issues. Um, uh, it, it, it's, it's lower today. But one of the reasons they could afford that broader legal aid was because the cost of the services was less to begin with. And, and this is, so you know, my previous presentation to the, to the task force that you were on uh, was to say, look, the reason we have an access to justice crisis is because our regulatory regime makes the practice of law incredibly inefficient. And that raises the cost. And I, I go through all those numbers that say, you know, that that two hundred dollars that a small firm lawyer has to charge to a client is actually only working out to about forty bucks an hour of compensation for the lawyer 
because there's just a huge amount of, of inefficiency that if you got technology and scale and other processes in there, you could drive down. So legal aid is much less expensive in the UK and therefore can be more generous. So we got tons of evidence that this has a big, that this regulatory regime has a big impact on access to justice. Third, third the, the UK uh, has not made this shift from regulating titles to regulating services. So we actually don't have good evidence yet about you know, what this kind of a regulatory approach uh, would do. And last, changing this regulatory regime is necessary but not sufficient for, for an impact. Um, you know, lots of great technology developed in, in England. I sort of think California could, could beat the heck out of out of that, you know, Iowa has the same corporate law as California, um, you know, but this is where this is where innovation happens. Uh, so I think that's really important. Um, your point about how do we make sure that we get targeted, we, we want to help, um, you know, lower income people who maybe don't have a lot of money to spend. So a couple of things. First of all, it's really, really important to recognize the access to justice crisis goes entirely throughout the income distribution. It is, this is not a problem, and, and, and the legal profession has framed this as a problem of poverty, but it's not. And your own study shows that, that, the, that access, uh, and, and believe me, that means something, right? I was a self-represented litigant at some point because I got driven into bankruptcy with all of my advantages and high income and so on, and suffered some pretty bad outcomes in, in, in family law matters that had a huge impact on my life. I mean, and that's, that, you know, the, the expense and the problem of not being able to get, like I couldn't find anybody to help me figure out how to count days to file my paper. And, and I'm, a, I'm a law professor, right? So I couldn't find that kind of help. The access to justice crisis goes throughout the income distribution. Um, and to be honest, we should be focusing more of our legal aid on, on the indigent. But here's a really important point. This is why I was emphasizing scale. You want to attract investment in the building of technologies and processes. And they don't have to be fancy technologies. They could just be an online platform that helps get people connected to legal experts. That's what they've got in the UK. They've had it for decades, right? To do that, you need scale. So you need somebody to be able to say, I can afford to provide this service because I've got volume. And that volume is then what drives those costs down to uh, things that people uh, can't afford. You don't get rid of your need for legal aid. You don't get rid of your need uh, for support for um, uh, people in poverty, um, but you, you, you need that scale. Um, and, and frankly, a lot of the technologies that get built, like an AI tool to help a corporation read its contracts, it's exactly the same technology that could be then say, okay, and I'm gonna give that technology to a nonprofit to make available to uh, uh, people who can't afford to pay for it. There's a whole heck of a lot of free services we know in the modern economy that are, you know, you get your free version and then you pay your subscription version, right? So I think there's actually um, lots of opportunity for, for those technologies to be built uh, that, that helps um, uh, people at the low income end of the spectrum. Professor, that's, that's, you. that's really helpful. Thank you. Sorry. We had asked for an hour of your time, which we have now used. And I have advertised to people that our lunch break was going to be from noon to 1230. But I know that there are questions that remain. So if you have a few minutes, for those of us who don't have to rush off to lunch to ask more questions, we will. And if you are ready to run, we will say thank you. I, I would ordinarily be delighted to stick around, but I seem to have been booked back to back and I have a farewell party for my director um, uh, at my um, organization, uh, which was due to start on the, on, at the top of the hour. So I am really sorry, I can't stay longer. I would, I'm happy to come back and talk to you more, or take questions over email or Where whatever might work. We may shoot some questions to you over email sure. or find some other way to take you up on that. But for now, let us thank you profusely for coming uh, in to talk to us on Zoom. Yes. Uh, yes. And we will uh, be in adjournment. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. Bye. Good luck.
All right, welcome back everyone. Sorry our lunch break was so short, but we have so many good things to talk about today. I'm going to now turn the Zoom microphone over to Randy DeFontorum to introduce our afternoon speakers. We're very fortunate this afternoon to have two uh, representatives from the State Bar's Office of Enforcement, experts in the attorney discipline system and in the State Bar's unauthorized practice of law enforcement. We have Jennifer Kisimizu Pinney, who is a senior trial counsel in OCTC. She is currently assigned to the non-attorney unauthorized practice of law unit and has previously worked in both the trials and intake units. Prior to joining the State Bar, Jennifer was an assistant district attorney for the San Francisco District Attorney's Office, where she worked in the misdemeanor, juvenile, domestic violence, and writs and appeals units. Jennifer was also a judicial research attorney for the Honorable Stuart King at the Superior Court of Alameda County and worked at Asian Pacific Islander Legal Outreach, where she handled immigration law, family law, and domestic violence restraining orders. Jennifer received her BA from UCLA and her JD from George, uh, where she served as the co-president of APALSA, the Asian Pacific Law Students Association. With Jennifer, we also will be hearing from Steve Molwad. Steve joined OCTC in 2017. During his time in OCTC, Steve has served as Chief Trial Counsel and Special Assistant to the Interim Chief Trial Counsel. Prior to joining Star State Bar, Steve was a Deputy District Attorney in Contra Costa County for nearly 20 years, spending the last five as the Senior Deputy District Attorney in charge of the Special Operations Division, including the Consumer and Environmental Protection Units, Auto and Workers' Compensation Insurance Fraud, Real Estate Fraud, and Public Corruption. Steve received his law degree from USF and his undergraduate degree in Political Science from University of California, San Diego. Steve also has an MBA from St. Mary's, and Steve has been on the board of directors of NOBC, the National Organization of Bar Council, which is the organization of attorney regulators across the country since 2019. We are very fortunate that they can take some time uh, to tell us about the discipline system, in particular the enforcement of unauthorized practice of law, as we just heard from Professor Hatfield. Uh, while she is an advocate for proactive risk-based regulation, she made a point to say that the traditional reactive remedial enforcement and complaint-driven will always have a place, and that our sandbox will have both attorneys and non-attorneys uh, as approved providers. So we get to hear now about uh, the longstanding attorney discipline system and, and some of the challenges we have there. Great. Thank you. Uh, Jennifer, I think you were going to share your, uh, your screen for the PowerPoint. Yes, I will go ahead and, and share my screen. Um, Is everybody able to view that now? Great. I can, I assume everyone else can as well. Great, thank you very much, Jennifer. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. As uh, Randy mentioned, uh, my name is Steve Mawad and I am here with Jennifer Kishimizu Pinney uh, to talk about the attorney discipline system and the state bar's efforts to combat the unauthorized practice of law by non-attorneys. Uh, we'll, we will tell you a little bit about our attorney discipline system so you can uh, compare and contrast that with the challenge of preventing non-attorney unauthorized practice of law and use both of those systems to analyze the benefits uh, and what would be needed to create a regulatory sandbox to enhance the delivery of and access to uh, legal services. So if we can move on to the next slide. Uh, thank you. Uh, so the o Office of Chief Trial Counsel, uh, by, by statute, public protection is the highest priority of the state bar, and, and the Office of Chief Trial Counsel is sort of how we uh, effectuate at least part of that mission as far as the regulation of attorneys uh, and the unauthorized practice of law. The Office of Chief Trial Counsel is essentially the state bar's chief prosecutor. Uh, our office is made up of approximately 270 uh, people, including lawyers, investigators, paralegals, and administrative staff. And we have units for intake, 
trials that includes phases for both investigation and actual trials, trial work, uh, appeals, non-attorney unauthorized practice of law, and a central administration unit. Our work is performed with uh, Supreme Court oversight uh, and with the exception of approvals, the lowest form of discipline, discipline is actually imposed by the Supreme Court. So what do we do? Uh, we investigate and prosecute administrative actions that can result in a public or private reprimand, suspension of the lawyer's law license, or disbarment. Uh, cases start in our intake unit, and uh, that is where we conduct an initial review of complaints uh, and other cases. And so here in intake, we make a determination as to whether if the violations alleged in the complaint are true, could they result in the imposition of discipline? If not, we close the complaint, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, and in most cases, do not ever notify the attorney that a complaint was filed. Uh, if the allegations, if true, could result in discipline, we forward it to our investigations unit where we assign it to an investigator and a prosecutor. So at this point in our, in our trials unit, <clears throat> uh, like I said, we have two people assigned, an investigator and an attorney, and they work as a team to conduct that investigation and make decisions as to what should happen next. In addition to other investigative steps, we contact the attorney against whom the complaint was filed so we can get their side of the story. Uh, once we have thoroughly investigated the case, we make a determination as to whether we can prove a violation by clear and convincing evidence. If so, we will engage in an early neutral evaluation conference discussion with the attorney in an attempt to settle the matter. From there, the case will either settle with a stipulation to discipline or where we can't reach an agreement, we will file a charging document called a Notice of Disciplinary Charges in State Bar Court. The State Bar Court, uh, thank you. The State Bar Court has a hearing department and a review department, uh, and the review department handles appeals from the hearing department. The review department opinions uh, can also be appealed to the Supreme Court but Supreme Court review is discretionary and not many cases make it that far. In state bar court, our prosecutors call witnesses and present evidence to a judge in an effort to prove the misconduct to the court. Again, as I mentioned before, we use the clear and convincing evidence standard, which is more than a preponderance of the evidence, which is the standard used in typical civil cases, uh, but less than beyond a reasonable doubt, which is the criminal standard. If we prove our case, the State Bar Court will make a recommendation as to discipline, and the Supreme Court will review the decision <clears throat> and make a determination about the appropriate level of discipline. The State Bar Court and the Supreme Court must also approve stipulations to discipline, which is what happens when a case resolves short of trial, like after the early neutral evaluation conference that I mentioned earlier. So that's how the process works. But where do we get our complaints? Uh, the primary sources of complaints about lawyers come from clients, judges, and opposing counsel. <clears throat> the most common complaints filed by clients are communication. Uh, obviously, a lawyer is ethically bound to communicate with their client. But of course, failures of communication can also contribute to other complaints. For example, a failure to communicate can result in a perception that a lawyer is not working on the client's case, which leads me to the next common complaint, which is failure to perform or failure to file documents. Uh, the, another common complaint is simply a complaint about an unexpected outcome of a case. They, the client expected the case to go one way and it ended up going another. And again, as I'm sure you can see, this may be related also to a lack of communication uh, or a lack of honest assessment about the case. Uh, another complaint that we often receive is about animus or a negative relationship between the client and the lawyer uh, and also disputes over fees. And we'll talk more about that in a moment. We also investigate and prosecute when an attorney is convicted in a criminal court of conduct that we deem to be moral turpitude or quote, other conduct warranting discipline. 
Uh, our office uh, also handles attorney self-reports. Business and Professions Code Section 608 paren O requires all lawyers to make certain reports to the state bar. Uh, we also handle reportable actions from banks. Uh, these are uh, these are circumstances where banks by statute are required to report when a client trust account balance dips below zero uh, because client funds are required to be held in a separate account and only dispersed when owed. This type of account should never have a negative balance. And so by statute, banks are required to report that such an incident to the state bar. We also handle reciprocal discipline. This is where a lawyer is licensed in both California and another jurisdiction and is disciplined in that other jurisdiction. Uh, we may also impose reciprocal discipline as a result of that other, uh, that discipline in another jurisdiction. Uh, we handle moral character appeals and investigations, uh, and we're actually lucky enough to have uh, the manager of the team that handles moral character investigations here today. So rather than having you listen to me drone on about it, I will hand it off to Mia Ellis to say a few words about those types of investigations. Great. Thank you, Steve. Um, as Steve mentioned, um, we within our office, the Office of Chief Trial Counsel, um, we receive um, applications when an applicant receives an adverse um, recommendation in terms of their moral character. And, but the moral character application process begins um, with the Office of Admissions. Um, the Office of Admissions re receives and reviews um, the moral character application. Um, the application is very broad. And those of us who have um, been admitted to the bar, we know the process. Um, it requires disclosure of, I'm going to highlight some of the big ones that often come up, um, employment history, criminal convictions, education discipline, um, civil lawsuits, tax returns or and unpaid taxes, for example, um, applications for admission to other jurisdictions, and um, character references. And specifically, there's also a portion of the application that requires the applicant to provide an accounting for time. So were there gaps in um, the time in terms of the, an applicant's history, they're um, asked to provide an explanation for the, that gaps in time. And that often comes up in for education where um, someone, there's a period of um, after high school, they attended a uh, school for a specific period of time and there was no, for example, a graduation, they need to disclose that, or it also comes up in terms of employment. The application also, um, most importantly also, um, includes an authorization and release um, that the applicant must sign and which requires that they're under a continuing duty to update the application in writing within 30 days. And that's um, to disclose any change in the original um, information that was disclosed um, or even possibly to um, um, update it or change it or modify it in some way. Um, the application process also includes fingerprints. They have to um, be uh, live scanned or prevent, provide fingerprint cards. Um, the Office of Admissions process is a general review of the application and verification of the information that was disclosed. Um, the information, sometimes once it's reviewed, it's verified, the Office of Admissions may follow up with the applicant to provide more information. Um, it's my understanding, generally, the process is a minimum of 180 days, um, but sometimes it could take much longer than that. Um, if, the, if, there, if the Office of Admissions has questions or concerns regarding the application, um, the applicant could be invited to uh, participate in an informal interview before the Moral Character Subcommittee. Um, and then from there, the um, applicant's um, application, the review is reviewed by the Committee of Bar Examiners. And then if there is an adverse moral character determination, um, then they, the applicant can appeal to state bar court. And then that case is then handled by our office. Um, cases in state bar court 
for moral character determinations are considered confidential, unlike um, original proceedings are open to the public. Thank you, Mia. In addition to, to moral character and the other cases that we've talked about, we also handle reinstatement cases. These are people seeking to return to practice after being disbarred and also reinstatements after suspension. And we call those mini reinstatements. These are when a lawyer is suspended for a long time. The court may also order that the lawyer seeking to be readmitted has to prove their rehabilitation, fitness, and present learning and ability in the law. And so we handle those uh, proceedings to determine whether they have uh, proved their rehabilitation, fitness, and present learning. Um, our office may oppose those petitions for reinstatement. Um, it's on a case-by-case -case basis. <clears throat> in 2019, before the pandemic, we received about 13,500 complaints. Uh, we also opened approximately 7,000 additional cases based largely on reportable actions, criminal convictions, and the unauthorized practice of law, just to give you an idea of our caseload. Okay, Jennifer, if you can move to the next slide. Thank you. So I also want to point out just a couple of things that we have that really supports our attorney discipline system, and it would be a very different system uh, without uh, these things. So I thought it was important to uh, discuss with you all to consider whether that's something that's relevant to the work that you're doing. Uh, the first is that a lawyer has a statutory duty to cooperate with our investigation. And it's actually a separate charge uh, if they fail to cooperate. We could, uh, for example, if we don't have the evidence to prove that original underlying charge because they failed to cooperate, we could charge them with that failure to cooperate itself. Uh, or it could also be charged in addition to the underlying charge uh, if we uh, had sufficient evidence. Uh, we also have the Office of Probation. Now, disciplined attorneys are required to comply with probation conditions that are set by the Supreme Court and the State Bar Court. And the Office of Probation's primary responsibility is to monitor respondent attorney's compliance with court-ordered or agreement-supported conditions of probation. We have the Lawyer Assistance Program. LAP, as it's commonly referred to, provides uh, confidential help to bar members uh, former members, applicants, and law students now with issues affecting their personal or professional life. Uh, LAP provides consultation, counseling, referrals for treatment, uh, recovery support, and monitoring groups addressing stress, anxiety, depression, and substance use disorders. And LAP programs uh, are funded by the imposition of a $10 fee on each bar member. So each licensee uh, is, uh, pays $10 to support the lawyer assistance program. We also have mandatory fee arbitration. And this is where earlier I mentioned that we made that we would talk later about fee disputes. And so the state bars mandatory fee arbitration program is an informal, confidential and lower cost way to resolve fee disputes between lawyers and their clients. I will point out, and Randy may disagree with me, but in, in my view, mandatory is kind of a misnomer here because clients are not obligated to participate in, quote, mandatory fee arbitration. But if they do choose to participate, it is mandatory for the lawyer. So that's important to note. Um, most fee arbitration is conducted through local bar association programs but the state bar does provide fee arbitration where there is no local bar program. The issues to be decided in a mandatory fee arbitration are very limited. The arbitrator will decide the amount of, of fees and costs, if any, owed to the lawyer or whether the client should, refund, should receive a refund uh, from the lawyer. We also have the Client Security Fund, also known as CSF. And this is a discretionary fund that can reimburse clients who have lost money or property due to theft or dishonest conduct by a California lawyer. Uh, meaning it does not reimburse a loss if a lawyer acted merely incompetently or failed to take certain action, et cetera. The fund can reimburse up to $100,000, depending on when the loss occurred. Uh, it, it is 
a state bar program paid for entirely by California lawyers. The fund does not reimburse interest, expenses, or incidental or other consequential losses caused by the attorney. It's really just money that was taken by the attorney, received by the attorney, and uh, taken as a result of theft or other dishonest conduct. Uh, we also have a mandatory continuing legal education requirement for all uh, California attorneys who are actively practicing law, with a few minor exceptions. Uh, this requirement, as I said, is called Minimum Continuing Legal Education, or MCLE, and it currently consists of 25 hours that are required to be shown every three years. Uh, these hours must include credits on ethics as well as competence issues such, such as substance abuse and mental health and, uh, and also diversity and, and the elimination of bias. We also have support for lawyers in the form of competence resources. And this comes in the form of ethics hotline uh, and ethics opinions. And the ethics hotline is a confidential telephone research service for lawyers. And this service is staffed by specially trained paralegals who can refer callers to specific rules uh, or state bar act sections or published opinions, uh, et cetera, um, of the California Rules of Professional Conduct, uh, whatever, uh, other relevant authorities. The ethics hotline does not render opinions or provide legal advice, but their guidance is often a starting point for people in, to push them in the right direction to do their own research and to aid lawyers in making really informed decisions about their, the, their legal ethics and about questions that they may have. The ethics opinions are uh, written by the Committee on Professional Responsibility and Conduct. This is COPRAC. Uh, that, that is one of the things, among others, that, that COPRAC does. Uh, and they draft these ethics opinions to facilitate compliance by licensees with their own, with their ethical duties. Uh, and these advisory opinions are based on questions submitted to the committee or developed by the committee on their own initiative. Uh, we also have Ethics and Client Trust Us Accounting School. Uh, this is uh, in an effort to provide assistance to lawyers in avoiding common ethical and client trust accounting mistakes. The Office of Chief Trial Counsel offers ethics and client trust account schools to all California attorneys. Uh, attorneys can attend voluntarily, in which case they are eligible to earn MCLE credits. Attorneys often also attend when they have been disciplined and they're required to attend one or both of those courses uh, based on the resolution of their, dis of their discipline case. Uh, so they would then go and hear the ethics class about the rules of professional conduct, selected provisions of the State Bar Act, and best client trust accounting rules and practices. So before I turn it over to Jennifer to talk about the NAUPL or non-attorney unauthorized practice of law team and what they do, I wanted to highlight some of the limitations that we have in enforcing laws uh, prohibiting the unauthorized practice of law. First and foremost is the state bar is not a, a law enforcement agency, right? We cannot criminally prosecute offenders. The most we can do, as you'll hear from Jennifer, is assume jurisdiction over their unlawful practice. And while part of assuming jurisdiction includes seizing bank accounts and returning money, as I'm sure you can imagine, these are often cash businesses. So there's rarely money to seize to, in order to return to victims in the first place. Not only are we limited in our law enforcement or in our enforcement options as a result of not being a law enforcement agency, but we have limited tools to establish that offenders are engaging in the unlawful practice in the first place. For example, we can't do undercover work. Uh, we cannot make surreptitious recordings. Uh, we cannot execute search warrants. Uh, we don't have a fleet of cars for our investigators to use to go out and do site visits. And DMV records are not protected for state bar investigators, unlike law enforcement personnel, which means that if they go do a field site visit in their own car, someone could track them down to their homes. Uh, further complicating our ability to get restitution, uh, the client security fund that I mentioned earlier awards 
awards from the client security fund are only available to theft or dishonest conduct by a lawyer, remember, and therefore the, a victim of non-attorney unauthorized practice of law fraud is not eligible to receive uh, any sort of benefit or award from the client security fund. With that, I'll turn it over to Jennifer. Thank you, Steve. So focusing on the unauthorized practice of law unit, the non-attorney UPL unit, it was established to investigate complaints against non-attorneys who engage in the unauthorized practice of law or hold themselves out as entitled to practice law, which is considered UPL. So as uh, Steve mentioned, we are not, uh, our matters are not handled in state bar court. So what we can do is in, in our proceedings, we can request the Superior Court of California to assume jurisdiction, and I will get to that a little bit later. Um, but for our proceedings, they are not in state bar court, and our uh, matters are handled uh, for assumptions in the Superior Court. So to go over a little bit about our team specifically, uh, our NAUPL team is a vertical unit of 14 members. And what, what I mean by vertical unit is that in the sense that the attorney who is assigned to the intake complete, the complaint at intake stage will then handle the investigation uh, matter with an investigator if it should go forward to investigation. So vertical in the sense that the attorney first assigned in the intake stage will then handle the matter and investigate the complaint through the investigation stage. So our team consists of an assistant chief trial counsel, or here in this case, Steve has taken, uh, temporarily taken the spot as, uh, <laughs> as a, a special assistant to the chief trial counsel, but um, normally it would be an assistant chief trial counsel, uh, a supervising attorney who is Gus Hernandez, um, three attorneys, uh, one senior trial counsel and two deputy trial counsels, five investigators, two paralegals, one legal secretary and one administrative assistant. So this is our team um, and we are all located in the Los Angeles office, but we do handle matters uh, across the state. So what is UPL? Just to give you a broad understanding, um, there is no statute codifying or defining what exactly UPL is or the unauthorized practice of law. Case law establishes um, that through the Benninghoff and Burbauer decisions that the practice of law is defined as doing and performing services in a court of justice in any matter depending therein throughout its various stages in conformity with the adopted rules of procedure. This includes but is not limited to giving legal advice and preparing legal instruments and contracts whether or not in the course of litigation. So it, that is the definition provided by the court and it's broad, you know, it consists of legal advice and preparing legal instruments. It's not very definite. It doesn't give us a black and white rule. However, um, and that is according to the State Bar Act um, under 6125 and, 20, 25 and 6126. And so to give you a couple of examples of what we have defined um, or uh, held to be uh, UPL um, includes holding oneself out as an attorney or entitled to practice law, giving legal advice, regardless if it's, if there's a pending litigation matter or um, any sort of legal advice and legal rights, uh, appearing in pleadings in court, appearing on behalf of another in adjudicated proceedings, including depositions and administrative proce proceedings, preparing legal instruments beyond the permissible scope. And I'll get into that a little bit later, but for example, in the cases of an illegal document assistant or an immigration consultant or bankruptcy petition preparer, there are limitations on what they can do. Uh, and, and that's according to the statutes in which they are governed under. So if they are uh, not providing or filling out forms beyond the permissible scope of the statute, then, then we would consider that UPL. So for legal document assistance, they must prepare documents in a ministerial manner at the direction of the, um, the, the client. So in this case, if, they, if a legal document assistant goes beyond that and 
fills out the form without consulting the client um, or provides legal advice on how to fill out the form or selects the particular documents that need to be prepared, then that would be considered UPL. Um, and like I said, also, if they give any assessments regarding any viability of their case or legal rights or how to proceed, that would also fall under UPL. And negotiating or settling claims, legal claims on behalf of others, that would be considered UPL. So here, the, stat the relevant statutes are Business and Professions Code 6125, and that says no person, person shall practice law in California unless the person is an active licensee of the state bar. And under 6126, any person advertising him or herself out as practicing or entitled to practice law and who is not an active licensee of the state bar or otherwise authorized pursuant to statute or court rule is guilty of a misdemeanor punishable up to one year in county jail and or fine up to $1,000. So in this section 6126, the otherwise authorized pursuant to statute or court rule um, refers to cases which uh, in which immigration are non-attorneys or attorneys who are licensed in other jurisdictions are practicing immigration law in California. So here, if there is an attorney who is licensed in Arizona and they are in California practicing purely, purely immigration law, that is permitted uh, under federal law. So uh, another example uh, under this statute would be the statute or court rule for pro hoc vice. So an attorney licensed in another jurisdiction may petition the court to be admitted pro hoc vice in which they would appear in a California case uh, and that would not be considered UPL. Some other relevant statutes that I wanted to just bring up are statutes relating to paralegals and that is under Business and Professions Code section 6450 through 6456. And in those statutes, they discuss what the parameters of what paralegals can and cannot do. So for paralegals, in terms of when we investigate cases, we may have uh, matters that involve uh, allegations of UPL conducted by a paralegal. So in those cases, um, we would look into these statutes and determine whether they be acted beyond the scope of their uh, the, the statutes. And so here, um, Paralegals must contract with or be employed by an attorney, law firm, corporation, governmental agency, or other entity while working under the direction and supervision of an active licensee. They may not provide legal advice, represent a client in court, or select, explain, draft, or recommend the use of any legal document except to his or her attorney, employer, supervisor, or engage in any conduct that constitutes the unlawful practice of law. Another important note is that they may not establish the fees to charge a client for services. Those fees must be set by the attorneys who supervise them. For law, legal document assistance and unlawful detainer assistance, Business and Professions Code section 6400 through 6415 are applicable. Um, sorry, there we go. Uh, it provides that the the, they may only provide self-help services to the member of the public who is representing him or herself in a legal matter. They may complete legal documents in a ministerial manner, provide general public uh, written information that, are, that is written or approved by an attorney, and they can make published legal documents available to those, those clients. They can file and serve legal forms and documents at the specific direction of the pro se litigant. So these are the, the guidelines under uh, what LDAs and UDAs can do. Anything beyond this scope would be considered UPL. Immigration consultants are governed under 6400, oh, sorry, uh, oh no, uh, my apologies. It should say LDAs, um, but this is a continuation of LDAs and UDAs. They cannot provide any kind of legal advice, explanation, opinion, or recommendation about possible legal rights remedies, options, the selection of forms or strategies. And they are required to register with the county clerk and pay a registration fee and post a $25,000 bond. So these are the requirements that LDAs and UDA, UDAs must follow. For immigration consultants, they, they are governed under, apologies, um, there you go. 
uh, it should say 24,400, 2440. And um, I will correct that in the, in, the, in the documents that I'll be sending or the PowerPoint that I'll be sending for. But in a sense, in essence, um, immigration consultants can provide non-legal assistance on an immigration matter, including but not limited to completing the form, translating answers to questions on forms, securing supporting documents and submitting completed forms to USCIS. So these are the limitations of what immigration consultants can do and making referrals to representations for uh, attorneys. They are also required to post bond and file with the California Secretary of State. So with regard to what our unit does, when we get a complaint uh, in the NAPL uh, unit, what happens is we'll get in a complaint, it'll go through the intake process and then go through the investigation and then a resolution. So at the intake stage, we can do one of three things. We can contact the complaining witness for additional information to obtain additional documents or supporting evidence to, to support their allegations of UPL, UPL. Or we can close the investigation if we feel that there is insufficient evidence of UPL or we can forward the investigation to the investigator stage in which it will get assigned an attorney and the investigator uh, to investigate the matter. The standard by which we, we determine whether to forward the matter to investigation is whether facts are alleged that sufficiently establish whether the non-attorney committed an act or acts that involve the practice of law. And if they are forward to the investigation stage, we will send law enforcement referrals to the local law enforcement agency and an other agency referral if, if, if that should apply. So the difference between law enforcement referrals and other agency referrals, um, if I can give you an example, is that in cases where we get complaints about um, an attorney licensed in another, in another jurisdiction, like I mentioned earlier, if they're practicing immigration law, then that may not be UPL. If they are practicing, if it looks like they are appearing in a California matter uh, without having been admitted pro hoc vice, then that could be potentially UPL. And at that point, we will send an other agency referral to the bar jurisdiction um, that they are licensed in, that the respondent or the non-attorney in California is licensed in, so that they may investigate whether uh, there is any sort of mis attorney misconduct there. For law enforcement referrals, we do investigate or we do send them at the in intake investigation stage, um, early in the investigation stage, so that we don't have to deal with uh, statute, statute of limitations issues. Um, and we are, you know, con concerned and we do send information, uh, all the information that we have at this stage and supplement throughout the course of our investigation, as well as send uh, the closing memo as well as the cease and desist letter should we determine that they are engaging in an unauthorized practice law at the end of the, the investigation stage. To give you a couple of statistics, there were 317 LERs, law enforcement referrals, sent in 2020, and 364 law enforcement referrals sent in 2019. Um, and that may, the reduction may be due to the pandemic. Um, we don't know, but that, that that could be an indicator uh, and, and a reduction of, of cases that were sent forward to investigation. With regard to in the investigation stage, the investigator and the attorneys will get together and com uh, complete an investigative plan. And that may involve contacting complaining witnesses to obtain additional information, research the non-attorney, the business, any sort of advertising, what sort of um, internet presence, presence that they may have. We look at uh, Yelp, uh, the Better Business Bureau. We may subpoena information from uh, Better Business Bureau and get the complaint history. We can conduct site visits. We conduct contact other witnesses that may be involved, such as court clerks or um, other opposing parties that may be involved. And then we also contact a non-attorney and get a statement, unless the facts indicate that 
um, an assumption may be warranted such that alerting the non-attorney could uh, cause the non-attorney to dispose of their files or remove their files or relocate elsewhere. So we take that um, step on a case-by-case -case basis, evaluate whether there is a need to, to contact that attorney or if we de deem that we will be pursuing an assumption and want to be able to preserve the evidence. And in our cases, we do prioritize investigations involving serious and uh, serious cases involving the most risk of harm to the public. So in terms of what we can do and what our remedies are, we can, at the investigation stage, we may close the case due to insufficient evidence. We can send a cease and desist letter to the non-attorney. We can apply for injunctive relief under Business and Professions Code 6030. We can assume the jurisdiction of the unlawful practice under 6126.3. We can request for civil penalties under 6126.7. There's a contempt of court proceeding under 6127. We can send law enforcement referrals, like I mentioned, and other agency referrals. So this is just a diagram to show you visually, you know, the process and the outcomes of each stage. With regard to cease and desist notices, when we have evidence that the non-attorney has engaged in UPL, but an assumption is not warranted, such that there is no brick and mortar office, there is no evidence that um, there are client files in the non-attorney's office, or there is no office. In those circumstances, the state bar will send a cease and desist notice. Some, some of the factors that we do consider before determining that is whether UPL was an isolated incident, it's not likely to recur, and the non-attorney is no longer in business. And some of the cease and desist, or all of the cease and desist notices uh, have now been noticed and published on the State Bar website, as well as published on our Twitter account. So the public is informed regarding those non-attorneys who have been issued cease and desist notices. The other course of action that we can take is an assumption of jurisdiction. And under the non-attorneys, uh, an assumption of jurisdiction under non-attorneys, the relevant statutes are 6126.3 and 6126.4, which is just a, a statute that says that the 6126.3 is applicable to immigration consultants. Uh, for attorneys, just to give you an idea um, or to contrast, in contrast, the assumptions of jurisdiction occur under 6180, and those involve the death, resignation, inactive, or disbarred or suspended attorney. And 6190, which in, in, include incapacity, including but not limited to excessive use of alcohol, drugs, physical, mental illness, or other infirmity or other cause, such as abandonment of their law practice. So those are the two uh, or areas in which uh, non-attorneys can the non-attorney practice can be assumed under 6126.3. And under that section, if a non-attorney is engaged in UPL or holding themselves out as entitled to practice law, the state bar will make an application to the superior court to assume jurisdiction over the unlawful practice. And in that application, we have to establish that there's probable cause to believe that the non-attorney engaged in UPL. The interest of the applicant is affected and the probable cause to believe that the interest of a client or an interested person will be prejudiced in the proceeding if, not, if the proceeding is not maintained. So in these types of cases, what will happen is that uh, I've had cases where an uh, immigration practice is holding themselves out as an immigration law office. Uh, the attorney or the non-attorney is not licensed in California, not licensed anywhere, was disbarred then we, they have maintained or continue to represent clients in USCIS proceedings, filling out forms, filling out GT28 forms, saying that they are a non, a, a, an attorney still um, entitled to practice law. And in those cases, we will file an assumption and take over or request the court to assume the jurisdiction over that unlawful practice. And we can go into that office after the court has approved uh, the interim orders and seize the files, seize the documents, 
uh, request the bank to seize, um, to freeze the accounts, the business accounts. We will ask the mail USPS to forward all mail to the state bar. They will forward the phone calls or the phone number to the state bar offices. And we will retrieve all of the client files inventory them with the state bar, state bar and then return them to clients. We also have a statutory um, statute governed under 6126.7 under notoria fraud in which a non-attorney, if a non-attorney translates any document from English into any other language uh, to imply that the person is an attorney or a notary public or notario publico or notario, the state bar can file a complaint in superior court for civil penalties and a permanent injunction. And the penalties are not to exceed 1,000 per day for each violation. And in this case, what we're really concerned about is immigration fraud. Uh, we want those non-attorneys who are holding themselves out as notarios, which is in, in many Latin American countries different than what it means here in California in the United States. In, in Latin American countries, notario means that they have had legal experience. They've had um, uh, legal training, knowledge. And so they can do more than what a no notary or a notario would be able to do here in California. And so we wanna make sure that in those cases, we are assisting those uh, in the immigrant community and um, ensuring that those targeted by notarios for fraud are assisted or receiving assistance. Some of the criminal consequences of under 6126 are that if it's a first offense, it will be a misdemeanor and up to one year jail, county jail time and or a fine up to $1,000. If it's a second offense, at least 90 days in county jail, except in an unusual case where the interest of justice will be served by an imposition, imposition of a lesser sentence of, or fine. And in those circumstances, that would be the court or the judge determining that a, uh, in, in the interest of justice, and a lesser sentence would be imposed. If it's a former attorney who has been involuntary enrolled, inactive, suspended, disbarred, or resigned with charges pending and practices or engages in UPL, then a misdemeanor would be up to six months in county jail, or if it's, a, if it's charged as a felony, it would be punishable up to 16 months, two years, or three years in county jail. So some of the information or some of the collaboration that we do with law enforcement at the investigation phase involves exchanging information, um, locating non-attorneys, um, engaging in undercover investigations, such as what Steve mentioned, since we, the state bar is unable to do that, we would request the DA's offices, um, if they have any resources to be able to do so. But like I said, it's a request. If they are underfunded or if they have other priorities or are unable to help in that manner, um, it would just be a request that they uh, assist our offices. And in terms of assumptions of jurisdiction, if we have hostile non-attorneys or are aware of any hostile non-attorneys, we may request the assistance of law enforcement to be present at the time of the assumption. Um, some of our education and outreach efforts include reaching out to law enforcement agencies. I believe uh, my supervising attorney, Gus Hernandez, did a tour of 24 law enforcement agencies uh, a couple of years ago in which they did presentations and uh, met with local law enforcement agencies to be able to advise them on what our office does and uh, how we can better assist their agencies in pursuing criminal complaints and uh, how we can work together. Our office has developed brochures pertaining to non-attorney and immigration fraud, and those are available, I believe, on our website, and some printing uh, availability and outreach has gone into place in which uh, agencies can request that they put their uh, letterhead or logo on these pamphlets and the state bar will assist in printing these, uh, these pamphlets out. Like I said, when we have cease and desist matters, those names and locations of non-attorneys will be published on our website as well as on our Twitter account. 
We do media interviews with um, staff regarding the work of the NAPL team. When we do assumptions, we will alert uh, media regarding those assumptions and uh, conduct interviews and outreach in ensuring that uh, immigration fraud does not take place and that consumers are protected. Some of the UPL statistics from 2020 are that we opened 637 NA non-attorney cases. This was a decrease of 30% from 2019, likely due to the pandemic as well. Um, 227 cease and desist letters were issued. This is a 55% increase from 146 in 2019. 317 LER law enforcement referrals were sent, which is a 13% decrease from 364 in 2019. We had three assumption orders granted, uh, the 25% decrease from four in 2019, and likely also due to the pandemic, given that we were restricted in our ability to go out into the public and do um, work visits or site visits and um, pursue assumptions and, and be able to pursue assumptions. So 1,178 client files were seized, were seized in 2020 and 312 files were returned to client, which is a 26% return rate. So now I will pass it off to Steve. Great, thank you. So as I pointed out earlier, uh, we have limited tools to combat the unauthorized practice of law. And while, as Jennifer detailed, we work closely with law enforcement, they do have limited resources and are stretched quite thin. Uh, while some offices have dedicated resources to combat these uh, these offenses, most have not, and they work them in uh, where they can with other cases. They're more than willing, but they just don't have enough resources to address this type of conduct. Further complicating this is the fact that, as Jennifer described, with some exceptions, unauthorized practice of law is generally a misdemeanor, which means that there's not a huge sanction for this type of conduct. Uh, this means that some people enter their plea uh, in criminal court, uh, move down the block, and set up a new shop. And it makes it very difficult for uh, law enforcement to enforce and for us to continually go in and shut down the new offices. Um, also, as Jennifer mentioned, there is really no clear definition of the practice of law in the sense of, uh, yes, there's case law that defines it, and yes, there are statutes that says that people who are not eligible should not, uh, should not practice law unless they're authorized, but it doesn't say what exactly that means. And as a result, uh, if it's hard for us as lawyers to define, it is certainly hard for other people to understand what those limits are, and it is even harder to prove when there has been a violation. Uh, and therefore, I, I think if, if you're open to considering regulation uh, suggestions, uh, I would recommend that you ensure that you adopt regulations that very clearly define what conduct is permissible and what conduct is not. Uh, and it shouldn't just say, shall not practice law or may only practice law in these areas or something along those lines. Uh, the more specific that you can be, the, the brighter line of a rule that is available, the better off uh, the public will be, the better off whatever regulatory system you put in place will also be. That's, uh, that's all I have for the, for the presentation. Well, thank you all three for making that presentation. That was helpful and I want to open it up for questions if there are members of the task force that have questions for any of our three presenters. I see three. I'll start with Micah, then move to Andrew, and then Jim. Hi, thanks. Um, I just want to focus on what I think we would be talking about here because, um, well, thank you both um, for the presentation and to Randy too for organizing it. Um, but uh, most of the presentation was focused on a lawyer or a non-lawyer practicing law. But what we're thinking about and need to wrap our head around is a corporation uh, engaging in, in the practice of law. So we're talking about, so I just wanna kind of flesh out an example so um, I can understand what your thoughts are on this. So let's say there's a corporation that 
um, hasn't complied with the corporation's code for a law corporation. They have an officer and director who's a non-lawyer, for example. Um, <clears throat> you would prosecute or take action against that corporation that's not a law corporation if it were to sign clients and go to court for them, right? So we, we don't actually take action against a firm. We don't have in California what's sometimes referred to as entity regulation. Um, we would go after those people individually for the unlawful practice of law uh, if, that, if we could establish that. Uh, but that there, we don't have jurisdiction to go after the, the entity itself. So does that mean if those um, lawyers who make up this firm that's not a legal uh, law firm or a compliant law firm, or, or let's say um, it's a firm that never registered with the state bar, uh, which is a state bar rule, right? So are you saying that you would go after those licensees for the unauthorized practice of law? Or is what I'm hearing that the, the BNP code, the state bar act, um, and the requirement to register as a law corporation don't, um, if you fail to do those, that doesn't expose anyone to any sort of discipline. So uh, maybe I misunderstood the question initially. I, I thought that what you said was that the president or or chair or whatever the corporation was not a lawyer, that those were, those people were not lawyers. Um, right, in which case- The rest of the lawyers in the firm could be lawyers, actual licensees. So is that the unauthorized practice of law and who is who is held responsible for that? So it's a violation of, of the rules of professional conduct currently, as, as I'm sure you're aware, to, to have a non-lawyer as a, you know, the, the partnership, fee sharing, all of those things that you guys are talking about. So those would be disciplinable offenses for the lawyer, right? If, if they are doing those things, those are things that we could prosecute them uh, as individuals for. We, we don't go after the uh, the entity itself. Now, you mentioned the obligation to uh, register as a law corporation, and I'm frankly going to plead ignorance on that because that's not something that, that we get necessarily involved in. I'm not suggesting that that's not a, a violation of the state bar rules, that somebody has to do that, but that again would, I, I, I Randy, hopefully can correct me if I'm wrong, which I almost invariably will be, but uh, the, somebody else in the state bar would seek to get them properly registered or something like that. It would not be something that we would take action against an individual lawyer for uh, as a violation of the rules of professional conduct. Yeah, so Randy? it's probably, it's probably uh, Robert McFadden. I think that's the dude, um, is that his name? Uh, so I, I think, Mike, you're referring to uh, Bob McPhail, uh, Robert McPhail over in the uh, Office of uh, uh, Consumer Attorney Regulation. And they do have the special admission programs, including law corporations, limited liability partnerships. And uh, for those activities, which actually law corporations used to be within the Office of Professional Competence many years ago, it, it really extending to those corporations that are registered. So if you are registered as a law corporation, there's a section in the State Bar Act that says you're supposed to abide by the uh, rules of professional conduct and duties of attorneys to the same extent as an individual licensee would. So the law corporation is theoretically held to the same standard as the practicing lawyer. But in terms of those law corporations that do not certify, then the exception in the State Bar Act uh, and it's statutory that really uh, negates what is the common law doctrine of corporations practicing law, the UPL doctrine for corporations, is not applicable. So it leaves them open uh, as a business to U, uh, UPL prosecution. Um, and from what we've heard today, I think one possibility is this concept of assumption of jurisdiction if they're engaged in major fraud or or possible referral uh, to law enforcement because the only corporations that are allowed to practice law in California are those that are registered. Okay, so it, just dumb it down for me a little bit because I had a, too big of a lunch and not enough coffee. So to, is there an, an office in the state bar now 
that would take any sort of disciplinary action if there were a complaint um, where the corporation, whether or not it's a real law corporation under the BNP code and the corporation's code, if they didn't register, is that the unauthorized practice of law? If somebody did not register and as from based on what Randy said, they're, they're not entitled to practice law as a corporation, they, they are then engaged in the unauthorized practice of law. However, as I said, we do not engage in entity regulation in OCTC. We don't we don't prosecute the the corporation. Uh, so if there was some problem, we would go after the individual people. Uh, and by go after in the UPL context, we're talking about going in and assuming jurisdiction over the practice in a situation where you are talking about where you, the, the people themselves are licensed to practice law, that's going to be a tough road. Uh, and so I don't know uh, exactly how that would play out, but I think that's an interesting question frankly, for you all, uh, because I think that we're going to have to in, it, to look at entity regulation as part of this regulatory sandbox. Okay, thank you. If I could jump in, uh, in, in, in some circumstances, we do get complaints against uh, businesses, and we will investigate those. If it turns out that they are holding themselves out of the law corporation. They are not in fact registered as a law corporation. We'll take a look at this California Secretary of State registration documents and see who the owner is. If that is a non-attorney, then we could pursue that as a UPL complaint against that non-attorney. If they are hiring attorneys to engage in the practice of law for their law corporation, then we could refer the matter to trials that they may be, those attorneys may be engaging in aiding and abetting a UPL by this non-attorney business owner or corporation owner. So that could, I hope that answers some of the questions. Yeah. Thank you all. Andrew? So I have two quick questions. One is if there, if you keep any statistics on the, the initiant of a complaint against uh, uh, you know, any of these entities that you're going after, whether it was specifically non-lawyer entities, whether it was a complaint by the public due to harm, or was it a complaint by members of the bar for the unlicensed practice of law, but there wasn't a set harm? Um, I, then, I don't... The second question just to get is around notarios also just in terms of data, how much, I grew up in a household where English wasn't the first language. And I know that um, going to a notario also is a matter of getting access to a Spanish speaker. And sometimes when you come from a low income neighborhood, there's an intimidation factor to go to a lawyer slash you can't afford one. So actually seeking out and having and having someone who in the neighborhood can help you with forms is something that's really good. Uh, however, it would be unlicensed practice of law. So is there, is, do you keep data on whether people are going to notarios because English as a second language is a factor? And again, that difference between was there a harm committed or was it um, you know, maybe an immigration attorney who says, hey, look, and told, I get it, went to law school, I've been paying in and this person is not paying in and I'm gonna kind of complain and, and kind of uh, initiate a complaint that way. So just the data on all these things. Um, so I don't think that we keep data, I could be wrong, but I don't think we keep data on, on whether the complainant was a, another licensee or a client. Uh, I don't think we could easily discern that from the data that we do keep. Um, I can tell you that uh, we do get complaints from other lawyers. Usually uh, the other lawyers that, that complain uh, are people who are the subsequent uh, lawyer that was hired by the person because the first lawyer didn't do anything. Uh, it's not somebody who's complaining, this person is taking business away from me. Uh, really, the complaint is, uh, I do, this client just came into my office and this person who doesn't know what they're doing filled out the wrong forms and now they're in deportation proceedings and they never should have been in this situation. And this person is out there harming other people. We need to get this fixed. Yeah. So that's the context where most lawyers, not all, but most lawyers complain. 
And, but Stephen, do we have the data to say which one is that, which one is the other? Is there any data that shows? Because right now, the thing that I'm really excited about with the sandbox is moving from anic data to hard fact and data. So that I, I, I practice as well, and I've, I've encountered that a couple of times myself, but I'm just trying to find information on this because I'm trying to put together a blog post as well, but it seems hard to find. Yeah, uh, Jennifer, I don't think that uh, when you guys are entering these cases that you uh, get down to that granular of a level. Am I wrong? We do keep track of if it's a complaint from a citizen, like a, a member of the public, or if it's a, an attorney. But it could be, an, it doesn't necessarily, I mean, attorney could mean, you know, uh, any, any kind of attorney. It doesn't have to be the imposing party or uh um, it could be a general attorney in the public who saw an advertising regarding this notario and just wanted to alert us or um, an attorney who who is the subsequent attorney on the case, uh, the attorney now on the case. So it's not that granular, but we do keep enter information who regarding who the complaining witness is. That, that's helpful. And then I think like for the notarios, is there any data around whether I think there would be really interesting to see who initiated it because in some cases a notario might be shut down and that might be the only affordable option someone has in a neighborhood in someone who speaks their language and I just think in that case it might cause more harm than good um, but I just I'm trying to write uh, some some literature on it and there just doesn't seem to be data on that. Um, again here I, I, I'm not sure that there is much data, uh, just because I think that the use of the word notario has really um, dried up uh, since the passage of the statute. I don't think people use it very often. Uh, we don't get that many complaints about it these days. Uh, I think that we have maybe one in the office right now, um, or at least in the last year or so. Um, it, we don't see it on the street corner. We don't necessarily see it uh, in publications, uh, at least as often anymore, uh, be, just because of the mere existence of that statute. Yeah, thanks, Stephen. I, I think we can, I'm, I don't want to belabor the point, but we keep hearing about it in terms of we need to be worried about notarios who are, who are unscrupulous and they're trying to steal people's money. But a lot of the stories I've heard about so-called notarios are Spanish speaking, non um, authorized to practice law is a lot of it comes from community leaders trying to help people in church groups, et cetera, who just maybe are here even illegally and don't are scared to interact with the system formally. But um, I, if I find any data on that, I'll, I'll spread it and, and kind of send it your way too. Uh, I would appreciate that. Actually, to, to reinforce what you're saying, I, I think that notario fraud is used interchangeably these days with uh, an unauthorized practice of law. Yeah. It isn't necessarily somebody using the term notario, yeah. which is a specific violation of the statute. It is uh, it, it is a substitute for the unauthorized practice of law. Yeah, yeah. And, and what the problem with that is I've, I've said that that actually points to some issues around systemic racism because it classifies and uses a Spanish word um, in a way that I think, uh, and then ties that to unlicensed practice of law. And there's a lot of issues with that. Okay, thank you. Let's move to Jim's question. My question was the same as Andrew's first question, but I do have a follow up with uh, Jennifer. Thank you uh, both for the excellent presentation. Jennifer, do you know what the breakdown and percentages is between complaints filed by members of the public and complaints filed by lawyers? That I don't have that information offhand. We can see if we can get that information. Uh, I'll talk to Jennifer about where they record it, but uh, I'm not aware of a specific field in the in our system uh, where it's recorded such that we could easily pull that data. Uh, but it may be that if they were putting it in a note field, assuming that it is recorded consistently, uh, that there may be a way that our data team can, can pull that. And if so, I, we can see about getting it to you. Thank you. And John had a question. Yeah, thank you both for the presentation, as well as Mia. I, I, uh, I guess I want to focus a little more on this question of, of harm and how it plays into what you're doing, consumer harm. As I understand the UPL structure, I don't think there's anything in the rules that says it matters whether or not there's harm to the consumer from the unauthorized practice of law. It's, it's sort of assumed, right, that 
that this isn't allowed. And, and I don't know if it's assumed it's not allowed because it's harmful, but in your, in your enforcement efforts and you know, limited resources being what they are, do you utilize the, the actual presence of consumer harm in some way to try to figure out you know, who to deal with and who to go after? And then I'll just add a second question. Maybe you can answer them together. On the back end, when you find somebody that's unauthorized practice of law, I, do, do, you, do you have data? Maybe this is Andrew's question again. Do you have data about what actual harm has resulted from the services that were provided? Um, and I guess related to that, do you know what the scale is of unauthorized practice of law in the, in the state? You know, uh, Are you finding just the bad apples or would you say you're pretty much finding everybody Who's, who's trying to provide legal services without a, without a license. So that's a bunch of questions. I apologize, but that's the whole set. Thank you. I'll, I'll, I'll give you a few thoughts and you can remind me of the questions I don't answer and then we can let Jennifer correct me. Um, but I, I suspect that we are not finding all the bad apples, uh, right? I suspect that for many of the reasons that Andrew mentioned uh, that people particularly those in the most vulnerable communities are reluctant to report because they don't want to um, necessarily uh, come forward. They don't want to get involved in the system. They're concerned about, uh, you know, their names being reported somewhere. Uh, and those are all understandable fears. Right. Um, and I guess the question really to that is, is there somebody that studied that it has like a, 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 a data-based sort of answer to that question, or I appreciate you guys are in the trenches and you probably just have that in sense of it, but do you know of someone who's actually kind of studied the scale of the UPL issues in California? I, I'm not aware of it. And I, and, you know, uh, maybe Andrew has, I don't know. Um, but, but I can say that it, I would think it would be hard to study uh, because uh, it's very easy, as I mentioned earlier, for somebody to set up a, a, a shop or a front or even not a brick and mortar shop, but, you know, word of mouth and they're available to do this work. And then they move down the street or they go to some other location. Uh, it's very difficult and it does uh, travel a lot by word of mouth. Uh, and it's, you know, in some ways tempting to think that these people are, are actually, um, you know, correcting the problem of the justice gap, right? I mean, if they are providing some benefit, the, the problem is that in most cases, at least that we come in contact with, they're not, right? What they're doing is they're taking people's money and not doing anything. Um, and they are filing the wrong form saying, oh, I can get you uh, this whatever. And they file the wrong form, Nobody shows up in court, all of a sudden they're in deportation proceedings, right? So uh, there is not that benefit that is illusory in most cases, um, or at least in many of the cases we hear about. That's not to say that there aren't people out there who are unlicensed but good intentioned. Micah has a question, and then Randy. Just very quickly, uh, I hope. Um, I haven't made my way through the 53 page state bar audit from from April, but I'm wondering, is there a reference to your department um, in the audit? And do you have a sense? I know we saw statistics from 2019, but do you have a sense of any backlog um, from the period of time the audit covered? So that would be 2015 until 2020. Uh, when you say backlog do you mean uh, do you mean in any upl area or or yeah oh, okay so backlog is a is a somewhat of a term of art uh, there is a statute that requires the state bar to report uh its quote backlogged cases which by definition is cases that that on december 31st of any given year uh that have been uh in our office without either being closed or filed with state bar court for more than 180 days, uh, which by definition means that they came in uh, either before July 3rd or 4th of that year or, or prior, right? Um, and 
they are very specific cases uh, because, for example, filing in state bar court, NAUPL cases aren't filed in state bar court. So there's no way for those cases to, quote, fall into backlog. Um, and so we have taken and applied our own uh, backlog standards to uh, the NAUPL cases, but it's, I don't think it's reported uh, in the audit, and I don't, I don't know that it's reported in the annual discipline report. Uh, but I, you know, I could probably get those statistics for you for currently at least. Yeah, I'd love that. And um, do you report it to the Board of Trustees? Does it get reported anywhere, I guess is my question. That is a good question. I don't know. Um, I don't know the answer to that. I don't know whether I believe that we give it to them. I don't know if we give it to them on a regular basis or there is a formal mechanism for giving it to them. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Randy. So just a question about general enforcement is, and then a second question about UPL. But in, in terms of general enforcement, earlier this morning, we heard from Professor Jillian Hatfield with regard to essentially proactive risk space regulation. And I was just wondering the thoughts of our enforcement staff on how compatible that would be with a traditional, you know, reactive complaint driven process. And, and if you think particularly in a, in a sandbox environment where, you know, and, and it's not a done deal that we're going to have a sandbox, but if we did have one, it might be for two years or three years. I mean, maybe at most five years, but in that time, in a normal reactive complaint driven sort of discipline uh, regulatory scheme, the opportunity for specific deterrence to a bad actor and the related general deterrent, uh, deterrence to the other, you know, sandbox participants for having not complied with the rules of the sandbox might be very limited. So I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts on the helpfulness or the compatibility of risk space uh, regulation, the active monitoring, reporting, and auditing going hand in hand with a, a, a standard, you know, complaint driven remedial enforcement model. And then on the UPL question, I've heard more than once, starting with ADELS and even through CPJG, that uh, the status quo is a bright line. Only lawyers can practice law. And if you change that bright line, then you are creating a lightning rod for the UPL uh, fraudsters to have another mechanism to harm the public. And so the example given is anytime uh, the media reports on politicians speaking about immigration reform, there's a spike in immigration UPL activity uh, because they're able to uh, leverage that to uh, mislead people into thinking that some future reform is somehow now operative or will be operative soon. So now you need to give me your money so that I can be ready to to take care of you. And there's even a statute that says neither lawyers nor non-lawyers are supposed to be taking advance fees for uh, immigration reform that has not yet occurred. Uh, how realistic do you think that is in terms of a risk for creating a sandbox? Because we're going to be able to control the sandbox, but we can't really control the world around us. And if, and if it's going to cause more UPL, and UPL is already stressed out, um, I, th I think we should go in with eyes wide open. So those two questions. <laughs> Thanks for the softballs, Randy. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I think that, that uh, you know, proactive regulation based on risk and based on, on fact is important. And I think that it's something that we are looking more at in the attorney regulation area, uh, being more proactive. Anytime you can prevent misconduct, it's much better than, than punishing misconduct after the fact. You're never going to be able to make the, the victim whole. Uh, and so if you can, uh, the, and most misconduct, uh, I would like to think, uh, at least not intentional misconduct, not theft or you know dishonest type of misconduct, uh, is 
just that. It's not intentional. It is uh, because people don't have support systems built around their practices uh, where, or they're not communicating enough or they are uh, stressed out or they have substance issues or whatever it is. And so to the extent that we can, can provide people with best practices for law practice management, uh, with aid for substance use disorders, with, uh, you know, getting rid of stigma so people can go get counseling for mental health issues, et cetera. I think that that will only help uh, prevent misconduct. Uh, that doesn't mean that, that we can't uh, or that we sh shouldn't uh, have a disciplined system as well. But as Randy said, I think they do need to work hand in hand. And one of the things that we've been working with with the Office of Professional Conduct is the sort of an online platform in this case, in this sort of test environment, it would be about client trust accounts uh, and best practices in managing client trust accounts. But really what we'd like to do is build that out to an entire law practice management uh, online resource where people can go and do a self-assessment of their own practice and of, their, of what they're doing and figure out if they're hitting all of the right best practices. And if not, they can try to incorporate those. We can give them resources, et cetera, to try and incorporate those into their practice. Um, so uh, uh, to your second question, Randy, and I'll let, let Jennifer weigh in on those as well, but uh, um, to your second question, I think that in the history of the human race, uh, we have uh, always seen that people will go out of their way to uh, take advantage of other people. Uh, I, I think that that's just the, the nature of the world. And so whether it is an attorney or a non-attorney uh, who is taking advantage of the immigration changes in the law, uh, of the housing crisis, of the, the dot-com bubble burst, of whatever it is, uh, there are people out there who are going to victimize other people. Uh, and so, yes, we have to be aware of that and go in with, with eyes open. Uh, and, and I think we do have to, to consider, uh, you know, whether those people who are doing those things are part of the sandbox or not part of the sandbox, right? And, and what impact that sandbox has on, on the outside world and whether that's truly attributable to that or to something else. Maybe it's a, you know at the end of the uh, mortgage and rent and eviction moratoriums for the pandemic, I expect, I hope not, but I expect that there's going to be an increase in mortgage fraud and refinance and things like that. So we are trying to get ahead of that as best we can, uh, but that may be an independent factor that would lead to uh, other type of misconduct, including non-attorney types of misconduct uh, that would be independent of this sandbox. So you have to sort of look at all of those causes. Thank you. I think Mary has a question. Sorry, Rand, I didn't mean to cut you off. I just wanted to say, just as sort of a concrete takeaway on the idea of prevention and, and risk space, et cetera, I mean, this is near and dear to my heart, but I would say if we have a sandbox and it's comprised of lawyer and non-lawyer participants, that even though something like the State Bar's ethics hotline is typically open only to our licensees, our lawyers, that we should change that. We should allow anybody who is applying, thinking of applying, or who is actually in the sandbox to have access to something like the ethics hotline, or maybe even have access to COPRAC to seek an opinion. Because if you take away something like the, the fee split rule, which is really a clear prohibition, and you take the theory that Arizona has that, well, the conflicts rules will, will, will govern that. Conflicts rules are even hard for attorneys, let alone non-attorneys. Support systems like an ethics hotline or access to ethics opinions to sandbox participants, I think would be helpful. And by extension of that, the, the other systems uh, that were mentioned in the presentation, mandatory fee arbitration, um, uh, a client security fund, I think those are also takeaways for having a sandbox. Um, anyway, just some reaction. Thank you. Mary, now you're on. Thanks. Uh, so I just had a follow up to John's question, um, which was, 
you know, in the enforcement efforts around UPL, to what extent is harm to the consumer utilized as a criterion for deciding on enforcement, you know, decisions and action? Because because I, I even noted in our conversation here, uh, just to echo Andrew's point, we're often in this conversation using UPL as a as synonymous with fraud, with misconduct, with harm. Whereas I don't think we know that, um, and I'm just. And it's a very interesting because it may very well be, and I I don't doubt that you know even in your in your comment about the uh, the ending of the eviction moratorium and stuff, there's going to be uh, you know a likely increase in mortgage fraud. That's probably true. There's probably also going to be an increase in the number of of non lawyers who by necessity are helping people navigate through some really difficult situations because there's no other resources for them. So it's a complicated scenario. And I think um, one thing that we are looking at is, you know, harm and, and to what extent harm should or can dictate enforcement and regulation. So I just, I wanted to return to John's question, which I apologize. I don't think you asked, but if you did, you can just correct me on that. No, I, no, I, absolutely. I, I, I may have missed that one. Um, Jennifer, I don't know if you want to weigh in on how in the UPL context, uh, you guys consider uh, harm. I know that it's you know part of our classification uh, prioritization system in the non-attorney, uh, but are there other ways as far as uh, you are evaluating those cases when you consider them harm? Definitely. So in terms of our assumption petitions to the court, we, we do allege harm uh, to any clients or victims uh, affected by the unlawful practice. So in cases where um, clients or consumers have been um, affected by the inadequate or illegal advice or representations that they are going to receive legal advice or legal representation and then the non-attorney disappears with their funds with their money and does not provide any sort of legal advice. That's a, that's a harm that we allege to the court that these, these victims have not paid $5,000 and did not receive any legal services. Uh, things to that effect, we do consider in terms of our assumption positions, we do consider that in terms of issuing cease and desist notices. Um, we do contact uh, non-attorneys and ask about those funds. What did you do with those funds? Did you, did you provide any services? Um, unlike attorneys, they don't have a duty to account, but what did they do with that money? Are they going to refund that money, especially if they didn't provide any legal, any sort of LDA or immigration consultant services, then they should not be, they should not hold on to that money. That money should be returned to the consumer. So in terms of harm, there is potentially harm to consumers and clients when they are paying for services that they did not receive. Um, any sort of inadequate or illegal advice, like, like Steve mentioned, if they are in immigration proceedings and they get inadequate, they are told you are entitled to this immigration benefit relief or relief and they seek that and they are um, then denied that relief and put in deportation proceedings, that's, that's a harm that we do consider. Um, any you know, unlawful detainers, if they are given inadequate advice regarding their unlawful detainer proceedings and get evicted, that, that's a harm. So we do consider all those uh, potential harms and concrete harms that occurs to, to consumers when they are given inadequate and illegal advice. Thank you. We do need to wrap this up in a moment. I see Andrew's had his hand raised for a bit. So Andrew, if you wanna ask the last question. Yeah, um, Stephen and Jennifer, thank you so much because it's tough because you're coming in, we're asking you a million questions and I know that's tough. Um, I think we're just really fascinated in trying to get as much info as we can for the decision. So I just want to thank you. Um, I guess, Stephen, you had said, in most cases, these individuals are um, using and, and pra un practicing law without a license and it's causing harms. You use, the, you use the terms most cases. And I guess, how do you know it's most cases? Because I, I guess I'm still kind of trying to figure out without any stats, there, it could be said that in most cases, individuals who aren't licensed practicing law might be providing a great service. And the reason why you don't hear about it is because there isn't any harm done. Now, I would say, Andrew, that's probably not true. But the problem is, is I'm 
justified in taking that position just as much as you're justified in saying, in most cases, it's really harmful. That's what I'm, so without the data, this kind of idea that there's a synonymous kind of UPL equals harm, I think is a very dangerous narrative. And I think it particularly is harmful when considering the sandbox or changes to things, because it starts with the presumption that things are working well right now. And just by, even Jennifer, you mentioned that story. I have many stories of lawyers, you know, taking off with trust funds and, you know, even trying to go into international jurisdictions and, you know, we can't touch them there. The problem is, is when one person says a story and the other person says a story, it's a story off, not a data off or a truth off. And I'm just trying to get to, to there's, I guess the question would be perhaps, you know, maybe in the future, actually trying to keep track of the harms in this data might be helpful, maybe a suggestion. And like I said, I truly am thankful for your time. And um, I didn't want this to be like you coming in and being on trial. It's just, we're really trying to grapple with this. And um, there's, there's this ingrained belief that I think is really hard to deprogram from our profession and culture and environment. So, so no questions. I didn't say that sounds like it's not a question so much as a repeat of the request for data if you're able to share it. And yeah, yeah, yeah. And a thank you, because I know I didn't want them to, you know, uh, come before and like feel like they're like before a Senate committee. So thank you guys. <laughs> yeah. you're, you're glad to know you're not before the Senate committee. We do all very much appreciate your assistance. If you do have data to share, you know where to find us. We would love to have you forward it to our uh, state bar uh, liaisons who will share it with all of us and we will be interested. And in the meantime, thank you for the information you did share today. Uh, we appreciate it. And we are going to stand in recess for just uh, let's say five minutes uh, to give everybody a little break before we come back for discussion. When we do come back for discussion, we're gonna, we're gonna jump straight into the SAGE discussion topics. So I'm gonna ask our SAGE discussion meter, uh, leaders to be ready to uh, kick things off for us in five minutes. And then we'll circle back to scope uh, that we had to cut off uh, towards the end of the afternoon. See you all in five and thank you. Uh, you're on mute, Justice Tucker. All right, sorry, we are back on the record and ready to roll and I will turn it over to our SAGE subcommittee chairs with thanks to everybody on the SAGE subcommittee who's been working so hard to get us ready for today's discussion. Okay, thanks everybody. Um, so, the, the, everything that we've discussed today is a good lead in for uh, what we have on our, on our plate today from SAGE. And we sort of have two things. If you notice, there's two agenda items for SAGE. One is the discussion of uh, a possible risk-based approach to regulation. And um, we are that, that's our second assignment in our sequence. So we are much are earlier in our progress on that one. Um, the first assignment that we had begun, which you will recall, was discuss, discussion of possible sort of forms of governance of the sandbox. That's at the end of our agenda, and I, I, I don't think we have an action item on that um, because we're still pending some research, which if we get to it today, you'll hear about that. But So just to uh, remind that this, this uh, issue of the risk-based regulation, which of course we've just spent a lot of time talking about, um, is where we have started in on our next phase of our SAGE work. So there's a, two memos, one of which we just had the opportunity to discuss at a SAGE meeting, one of which we really haven't. Um, but the, the first uh, is a discussion of proposed guidelines for collecting and analyzing data to assess the risks of sandbox entities. Um, and I guess what I'd like to do, unless John, if you want to say anything about that, uh, we'd like to turn it over to Jim Sandman, who shepherded us through the preparation of that memo. Uh, thank you, Mary. Uh, the memo is really a summary of the approach that uh, Utah has taken and of comments from the Adels uh, report without taking a, a position on whether uh, those are good ideas or not, but it starts by trying to identify the risks that we would be trying to control uh, through regulation in a sandbox and then moves to 
trying to identify what kind of information we would need to do a, uh, an effective assessment of those risks. The, one of the issues that we have to address is how to accomplish this feasibly in light of the scale of the sandbox that California might have relative to the one that Utah has. How do we handle large numbers? One way that Utah tried to deal with that was by categorizing uh, different types of proposals according to the extent to which lawyers are involved. The assumption underlying that approach is that more lawyer involvement equals lower risk and vice versa. I actually question that. Um, I, I, I see lots of ways in which <laughs> Uh, lawyers do things that pose lots of, of risks. Uh, I also think that if you have a presumption like that, that could deter participation in the sandbox by entities that are not dominated by lawyers because they'll look at the regulatory structure and say, this is all lawyer controlled and, and we can't win in an environment like this. That it might uh, discourage applications that would be meritorious because people are making assumptions about an unfriendliness toward entities that are not heavily dominated uh, by lawyers. But that's the approach. It was intended to start a, a discussion about the risks that we're um, trying to build our regulation around, the information that we might need to be able to conduct an informed assessment of those risks, and what kind of practical approaches we might take to be able to manage the process at scale. That's a helpful overview. I don't know if uh, one of our SAGE co-chairs wants to pick it up from here or whether I should urge Jim to give us more specific questions that he wants the sense of the group on. Mary, what's your? Uh, I think we would, um, well, whatever Jim would like, uh, I would certainly defer to him on this, but uh, I think that we would very much, especially since this, we are, are earlier in the stage of preparation on this. Um, I think that we would like to get people's thoughts. I mean, what Jim is describing and, and working out in this memo is trying to uh, anticipate, you know, risks at the outset and how to, you know, define them. Um, and I think that we would like to get some discussion on that. One piece of this, the other piece of this discussion generally is the second memo, which we really haven't again discussed as a committee, but which is um, sort of a, a deeper dive into how um, uh, the program, how pr the program oversight would happen and what are the components of program oversight, which um, kind of goes hand in hand with uh, a lot of what we've been talking about today, what kind of um, you know, uh, complaint process, what, what other types of, of um, kind of, I don't want to say enforcement because that's, that's different, but in terms of what me mechanism and tools are there in place to try to make sure that the, the consumers involved aren't getting harmed and what can we do to um, achieve the regulation, whether it's, you know, entity regulation, risk-based regulation, whatever it is. Um, but one component of all of this, which uh, I think we do want to talk about, uh, is the idea that where lawyers are involved in sandbox entities, the lawyers would remain subject to, or, or it's a question actually, would the lawyers remain subject to the rules of professional conduct and other uh, standards that apply to attorneys other than as specifically waived by virtue of the sandbox, you know, rules and regulations. Um, and I raise that, I don't, Jim, I can't remember if that's really in your memo. Uh, we raise that as it's kind of a threshold question to help people think about risk. Um, and I think it touches on some of the, of the issues that were raised earlier today too. Um, I think we'd like to get a sense of the group, you know, whether that is something that we are all uh, in basic agreement on so that we can uh, utilize that as we go forward. So you're asking for a sense of the group, or, or let, me, let me put it this way, is there anyone who disagrees with what sounded like the inherent premise there that lawyers should remain subject to all of the rules of practice and statutes that govern them? 
even when they are practicing with or through an entity in the sandbox, unless specifically exempted by the, I'll say sandbox license. Looks like Tom Green and Andrew Arruda in that order have something to say to that. Are we, are we voting or are we saying something? We're, well, only raise your hand right now if you have a question or comment on this specific issue, not a vote. Yeah, mine, mine is more of a question, I think, more than anything else. Because um, we've been talking about things like 5.4 and all those kinds of things. But I think there's, in the mix, uh, in the state, current state bar rules, are supervision requirements. So I'm, I'm a managing attorney within the context of um, the current rules. So I have responsibilities that, if I don't discharge them, affect my bar status with respect to junior lawyers, and even more importantly, uh, with respect to non-lawyers. So I think one of the questions that I think at some point we're gonna to have to address, because we seem to be thinking about technologists and paralegals and all kinds of other people, that um, what about those rules? So the, the ones that seem most interesting are 5.3 and there's one other. In any case, I, I just think we just need to be aware that the focus so far has been on uh, 5.3 and 5.1. Uh, those are the two, and that may affect what lawyers can do in, in this broader context. One other note or footnote to that point is that when you look at the, uh, the United Kingdom's regulations, one of the things they require is there be a head of practice who is responsible for the lawyers and the people at the lawyers supervise following the rules. And that that is also something we may want to do some thinking about in terms of the regulatory process here. But major takeaway, there are rules beyond whether or not somebody owns your practice or not that may be in play. Yeah, so, Tom, if I, if I could address that uh, just in terms of, of, of how our court's been dealing with that. Mm -hmm. we And I think, I think it's actually embedded in some of the application process materials that the scope committee put together you know, there's a request really being made that any applicant articulate particular rules of professional conduct that that mm -hmm. would need to be exempted in some respect in order for oh, well yeah. the service to be done. And that's, I guess the, the structure we, we seem to have is the 5.4 stuff that's a business entity and all of that, it's sort of built into the idea that if you're asking to be in the sandbox, th there must be some part of your model, non-lawyer ownership or whatever that, mm -hmm. that indeed needs you to be in the, in the sandbox. But that has specific other rules, such as the supervision of paralegals or non other non-lawyers uh, mm -hmm. or client trust account information, or so, that sort of thing. We ask the applicant to identify any of those that they think are implicated. And then the court order that issues gives the, the entity that narrow and specific exemption for that service. So now the lawyer who's participating, you know, should take comfort in the fact that they've been specifically exempted within the scope of that, of that particular service from, from complying with that particular rule. Cause I, I think it's a concern for lawyers, you know, well, I'm not going to get involved with this, <laughs> with this sandbox entity if it's perceived as uh, you know, the contrary to my ethical obligations to be involved. Sure. I think I, I, I think I, I don't want to dominate here, but you know, I think there I have two reactions. One is I think that exemption probably helps the lawyers involved in such a thing, but it raises questions about to the extent to which we assume that lawyer involvement means that somehow this is safer if the lawyers do not have these obligations to make sure everybody's following the rules. That raises questions about, I mean, within the premise that lawyer involvement is more of a guarantor sure. or guarantor of safety than not. Uh, well, it's just yeah. something we need to think about here. Sure, and it's just, it, it is so hard, I think, because we're talking about these things in the abstract. And until you see somebody's proposed service and you see what their structure is, it's really it, it's really hard to make a hard and fast, you know, to me, it's hard, it's, it's difficult to make a hard and fast, you know, call on whether that is or isn't gonna be a problem. Yeah, I think that I, that's a point well taken from my perspective. I think one of the parts of the, the the scope debate, not to go over there too much, but you know, was to get some more detail in terms of relationships and management structures, so that we could actually make those kinds of assessments, or at least 
put people in a position who were in charge to, to make an assessment that made sense. Micah, you had a question or comment? Yeah, are we, um, I don't know if I have a good understanding of this or not. When applicants are in the sandbox, are they actually providing, like testing the legal services with consumers? Or are they just building something out that then if it gets approved, they get to uh, get real clients? Because I think I think what we've been talking about is a sandbox regulator or a sandbox entity who will consider applications and in appropriate circumstances approve them. And once the sandbox regulator has approved an applicant, then the applicant would presumably provide the services. And we could call that providing the services in the sandbox, just meaning that it's within the regulatory authority of the sandbox regulator having approved it. Okay, so but we're talking about after it's been approved, whether or not we need to think about things like 5.4 and the other rules, right? Not when they're in the building out process or the application process, or is that what you were worried about, John? I'm not, so I think all of this approval is is before they're actually providing any services or before they're testing anything with any clients, they're coming and presenting their proposed service and how it would be structured and that's being assessed. And all these things like, okay, this looks okay to us. We're gonna recommend it to the, to the court to authorize it. All of that happens before they provide any services. And then when they do provide the services, you know, that non-lawyer ownership partial non-lawyer ownership or whatever it is, a multidisciplinary service is then authorized by the order of the court that, that comes out. Um, I, I don't know if that's answering your question, Micah Starr. So even if um, they're just in the application process, there's no conflict with 5.4 if it stayed exactly the same, is there? I, I, I guess the thing is, I don't think they're actually doing anything one way or the other, whether it's just an application process. In other words, there's no actual services being provided until they get permitted. And so once they're permitted, that's when we have to worry about, from your perspective, a 5.4 modification. Right. Okay. So. Eric, did you have a question or comment next? This was just a clarifying question. John, from what you said, it, it sounds like the way this works in Utah is that the, the court order literally lays out what sort of regulations they would be exempt for, uh, exempted from under bar rules, including the unauthorized practice of law, but only within the narrow scope of what was in the application. A am I getting that right? I just wanted to clarify that. You are, and I, I, may, have missed, I may have confused myself and everyone else, but the, you are getting that right, Eric. It's just that there's sort of a a, a presumption since you came to the sandbox that you have something that deviates from 5.4. Right. You have something going on with your model, you know, whether it's a business arrangement with a non-lawyer or, or whatever it is, that means you need to be here talking to the sandbox at all. But then as to the sort of the broader, broader entire set of rules like advertising rule or client trust fund rule or supervision of non-paralegal of non-lawyers, that's where we, I guess, get specific about that particular piece needing to be a permitted for the type of service that's being described. Okay, yeah, that, that's what I thought. I just wanted to make sure I had yeah. that right. Appreciate it. Uh, Kevin Moore, thank you. Okay, uh, I think I also need a little bit of clarification here, but my understanding is uh, Utah has revised its rule 5.4 and in two separate uh, paragraphs specifically refers to standing order 15 is it of the Utah Supreme Court so that lawyers know that they are not assisting in the unauthorized practice of law so long as any company in the sandbox has been already approved by the Supreme Court. Is that correct, John? Okay. Yes. So that, that's sort of taken care of. So I infer from that, that lawyers are going to be subject in the sandbox to all other rules, unless specifically waived. I mean, I, I think yeah. that's a reasonable inference to make. 
Uh, right, and I think, you know, one of the things that Mary and I have been working on a bit here is can, can some pieces of this, I understand there's some significant questions we're gonna to have to work through as a group, but can some pieces of this be sort of built, agreed upon that we can build on? And one of them, and, and we have a resolution prepared, I don't know if we wanna vote on it, but, but I think Justice Tucker was at least trying to see if we had consensus would be that if an attorney is participating in an entity that's in the sandbox, they remain subject to all the all of the rules of discipline that that we were just debriefed on, except to the extent they've been specifically exempted uh, by the order that grants them the, the the sandbox entity authority. So that would be a question. That we is there anybody that sees that as a as as a problem, or is that just like you just said, Kevin? That that's going to be presumed that that's the situation. I think it's a reasonable inference. <laughs>